work sessions are a little more informal in our uh, format. If anybody's here and does not have a copy of our agenda, there are ones back on the count on the uh, cart there, and uh, feel free to help yourself. Um, we don't uh, make binding decisions, uh, generally speaking, at our work sessions. It's mostly an opportunity for exchanging ideas, giving direction to staff. So um, before we uh, jump into our uh, regular agenda, uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment. So we'll do that. And then we'll, we had a, a major rain event uh, this weekend. And so uh, we'll turn it over to our city administrator. So I think we'll turn it over to our public works director to make some comments about uh, the weekend's events as well. Um, and that way also, if there's public comment uh, on that topic, uh, Debbie can uh, comment on that potentially as well. So with that, let's open up for public comment on any item, uh, whether it's on our agenda tonight or not. Mr. Essman, you know the routine, more or less Dude. three minutes. <laughs> uh, Mayor and council members, my name is Jeff Essman. I reside at 3130 McMaster's Road. Uh, 23 years ago, I was on the city county planning board with our esteemed mayor and a fellow member named Doug Clark. The three of us were tasked by the planning board with preparing the West End Area Plan, I think it was called. Yeah, yep. And uh, I'm here today because things that we learned in that process concern me because of the rain event that happened just this last weekend. Uh, Doug Clark had recalled from hearing from an, an early member of the, an original member of the Yellowstone County Planning Board, Mr. Lenhart, of the 1937 flood event that Mr. Lenhart witnessed as a child and recounted stories to Doug of dead cows and trees going down Canyon Creek. So when we were tasked with developing our plan, Doug, uh, you know, had staff start digging and they found uh, an Army Corps of Engineer plan that had been developed in the early 60s to deal with those storm events. It called for a large detention pond and then a large drop structure, I think 30 or 40 feet wide, to stop the flow at Shiloh, right where the roundabout is, and then direct the water down to Canyon Creek. Uh, a lot of people were unhappy when that was resurrected because it, you know, obviously had impacts in terms of the potential development of the farmland to the west and the commercial property that they could see even 23 years ago was going to be on Shiloh Road. So uh, the core plan was disposed of. The, the city fathers and county commission decided to restudy the issue. They prepared a plan that saw reduced amounts, but what we saw this weekend was that those flood events can still happen. Actually, we're right at the most dangerous point as compared to 1937, because that ground is now saturated. If we get another torrential rainstorm there, we're gonna have, we could have a 1937 type event. Hogan Slough drains two big drainages, uh, Cove Creek and Little Cove Creek. Um, I, Fortunately, the, that conservation area retention pond worked as designed. Uh, the Shiloh Road roundabout, which was reduced in elevation compared to both sides, also worked as designed. The water filled up the retention to tension and then crossed Shiloh Road as designed. Uh, and then it ponded. And that's where the concern comes from because uh, the siphon is not adequate to carry all the volume, and the same risk can... And go ahead. May I please? Sure, Thank finish. you. The same risk continues, that the, those waters can overtop the banks of the BBWA Canal, which Doug Clark reminded me, 400 feet of it was washed out in 1937. That's, uh, that water entered the canal proceeded to basically the vicinity of Eastern and broke the banks there and then flooded downtown. So my question, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I believe that the study that was done after the West End Area Plan was completed called for multiple detention retention ponds in the Hogan Slough drainage um, to basically meter the flow so that uh, 
a threat to washing out the BBWA canal to, would not exist. And so my, I'm, be, I'm here today <laughs> to ask a couple of questions, and that is, um, is that still the plan? <laughs> Do we have multiple detention, storm drain, retention, detention ponds planned in the Hogan Slough drainage? Do we have ground purchased for that or designated? Is there money set aside for that? Is there a schedule for construction? Um, those, that would be the questions I would like to ask because obviously um, the single detention pond we have today is not adequate to deal with it in a safe manner. I don't know how long Gable Road is gonna be closed, but I'm guessing it's gonna be a while. Um, when I went by, the crew said <laughs> we got to have the water drop before we can put in a culvert. So, um, good planning saves money and it saves lives. I firmly believe that. That's why I served on the planning board and I encourage you to continue to engage in good planning and protect the citizens and, you know, the valuable property in that vicinity and downstream. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our timing is good with our public works director. Um, any other public comment uh, either on items on our agenda or not on our agenda? Uh, the items on our agenda will have an opportunity for public comment on those specifically when we get to those items. If not, we'll close the public comment. There is no one else online, so uh, the public comment period is closed. And with that, uh, uh, Chris, anything before we turn it over to Debbie? No, I, I'll have Debbie put together some slides she had some of this information they've been pushing out over the weekend just to try to communicate with folks, as we're all aware, right? Billings is a dry, generally a dry, arid community that gets roughly 12 inches of rain a year. And in some parts of Billings, we got, Billings, we got almost six inches over the weekend. So uh, needless to say, we did have um, some storm during challenges, although our crew and our crews were working around the clock to do to stay as much on top of things, keeping drains open, keeping things flowing, and um, the invest some of the investments, significant investments made over the past few years made a difference. But that didn't mean there wasn't any pooling of water when you get over five inches of, of, of rainwater in a relatively short period of time. I don't have any of the answers to Mr. Essman's questions. I'm not sure. Uh, it's not been a topic of conversation of recent. Um, so it may be something we need to circle back on. I would uh, state what probably is the obvious, which is yes, I, I couldn't concur more. Good planning saves lives and saves money. And then there's a very deliberate point at which we build infrastructure to. I mean, it, it all ends up being a cost and a risk analysis as to what storm we make developers and ourselves build to and how we deal with these issues when we get them. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie to show what our crews did, some of the areas we do have some improvements to make and a emergency declaration we'll make in order for uh, us to get Gable Road open back up quick, more quickly. Okay. Debbie. So I do have a, a little bit of information about the West End. I'll share that at the end of this, so. I know. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So the first thing I just wanted to show these rainfall amounts, it was a huge amount of water. So if anybody uh, was here this weekend, you probably know from your yard and everywhere else that it was a lot of water. Um, we installed a bunch of storm gauges last year, which was really uh, timely, I guess. Uh, so we have all this data that we collect by the minute. So we're able to really see how these storms come through town and it helps us plan things. So um, you can see a 100 year 24 hour storm is about 3.4 inches. Um, Yellowstone Country Club was the biggest at almost six inches of water. So. Would you like to add my house, Debbie? It's over six because my rain gauge only holds six and it was overfilling that, so. Okay, well, we'll get you on list on this next time. Okay, good. Um, I hope to not see a full rain gauge again, <laughs> so. Um, so these are, these are big numbers. I just want to show you these so that you can see some of what happened here. If you had told me a year ago we were going to see six inches at Yellowstone Country Club, I probably would have anticipated more damage than we actually saw. So as weird as it sounds, I actually have some good news. Um, 
it's all pictures here, but Gable Road was by far the biggest thing. Hogan Slough comes in there. Um, and so this is the bottom of a big drainage area, a really big drainage area, not just in the city, but in the county. And so everything comes down to this point. Everything was going pretty well until it wasn't. So um, this was by far the biggest damage that we saw uh, during the event. And um, I just wanted to show pictures because they're pretty great. We did get that stabilized cop construction came in basically in the middle of the night for us and stabilize us so that we won't lose more of the road. Um, but we will be coming back to get an emergency resolution to fix this. If we have another big rain, uh, we're somewhat limited by what we can convey through here. So this is not a good thing um, with the forecast that we have. Here we go. Here's a video. I think it's 19 seconds. This is the corner of Hesper and Gable. Again, we're at the bottom end of everything. A lot of water. That didn't actually do any damage after that dried out. It looks pretty good, a little bit of erosion on the corners and that sort of thing, but it did, uh, didn't cause a lot of damage. Shiloh Road's the same way. We did have a lot of water in there, um, but once it went down, we have a little bit of erosion to take care of, but not a, not a huge amount of damage to that area permanently. And Broadwater, uh, again, affected a lot of people. The Arnold Drain runs through there. Again, a huge drainage area that goes into the Arnold Drain. Um, so we have a trash grate on there that ended up plugging. It caused a lot of the problem, but just the other problem is just too much water. So we have a 54 inch downstream of there and that's a lot more than 54 inches of water. So uh, the good news, we have done a lot of work in the last several years. You've seen it on our CIP. Zimmerman used to to um, flood every time. That subdivision to the west of Zimmerman and Rimrock, the northwest corner, every event used to flood. We did not have flooding in there. City County Drain and Kings Green, the area that for every single storm did not flood this year. Um, we were able to keep that pond full, keep pumping to the river. Um, and then the retention areas to the west all held water. So it, it didn't look good in a lot of these subdivisions, but all these ponds we've been putting in for exactly this purpose worked. And so we were able to take that head off of all those drainages um, by installing all the retention areas on the west end, including 62nd and Rimrock that we own. And then we have um, a couple more throughout town. So they, they worked, they did what they were supposed to. We need them to drain out now because if we get more water, that's gonna be a problem, but we're pumping a lot of them and just trying to get everything to drain. So the impacts, like I said, Zimmerman and 6th Avenue North, we, if you're all our Facebook friends, you know we closed those roads because of rock falls. Um, we need to get up. We scaled those in 2014. We need to go scale those again, which just means knock the little rocks down so they don't end up. Um, so we'll have a little project to come along to scale all those rocks. Uh, the Gable Road reconstruction, you'll see an emergency resolution on the 12th of June, and we're basically just asking that we can get out there and fix it without doing a bid. We will find a contractor that can do it, get the materials, and just start that process. We need to get that drainage reopened. The Arnold Drain great system, we're going to work on that and have more of a something that'll just kind of let everything go if something happens like this again. A lot of erosions, we're jetting, and then there's gonna be a lot of insurance claims that we, we will probably see through this event. Because of the size of the event, I'm not sure how MMI will handle that, but um, a lot of times the size of an event, um, MMI will, we won't usually be found negligent in those situations, but certainly I can't say that for sure. And that's, that's it, I just wanted to show those pictures. Um, we did a, as far as the West End goes, we did a study about four years ago, looking at the old studies, looking at the new studies. The EPA has changed or DEQ has changed how we have to do storm drainage. So we no longer can just flow everything off um, into pipes and into drainages. We have to do the water quality storm, which means everybody has a retention area. You have to, or a water quality storm scepter or something. So what we're doing is we're taking the peaks off of everywhere. And so if you look at the whole West End, we've, we've got regional ponds, we've got storm drain ponds in every subdivision, um, a lot of maintenance, but what that does is that takes the head off of all of those storms. And so those drainages don't get overwhelmed as quickly. So um, what that last study did is it looked at where some more of those regional ponds need to go to keep taking that head off of that. And so we're just, that's part of the study that you see and that's part of our CIP. Every year we're just chipping away at more of those. So that's how we're addressing the West End. Okay, uh, question, uh, Debbie. So the, for Jeff's specific questions about 
more retention areas um, and uh, uh, whether that's going to be adequate in that area that drains Hogan Slough, what would you say to that? The study we did looked at all the development. It looked at what the, the storm drainage was from the area, took into account the new development type. And yes, we're building it to accommodate the flows that should be coming from that area. That drains a huge base, and it's not just the city that's draining through there. So we can only control a certain portion of that. Um, and we have to be careful to meter those flows because we don't want to flood people downstream by opening up every culvert you know, twice as big or three times as big if that can't handle it downstream. So it's a, it's a very um, specific approach to how that drainage will flow, but the, the study has everything planned out. We just have to build, build it now. Okay, mostly on specific private property as it comes online and is developed as opposed to a new conservation area or some oh. large, or both. There actually are plans for new large public areas as right. well. Right. Okay, okay. All right, uh, others, uh, Council Member Nies and Council Member Pierton, you have your hand up? Thank yeah. you, Mayor. Uh, hey, Debbie, how did, we heard a lot about the West End, how did the Heights Fair and kind of issues up there that you need to address because in, in, in past, when we had storms, I mean, water run down roads into people's, you know, basements, stuff like that. So have you heard how, the, how we fared? Because I know you've, we've done a lot of work up there. Yep. And, and actually, um, most of the facilities in the Heights performed very well. And you saw that the Heights got 3.4 inches, I think, um, the couple of places that we look, Skyview and Medicine Crow. Um, so a lot of the systems were able to, to handle it. There was road, there was some standing water in the roads, that kind of thing, but drained out fast and didn't leave a lot of damage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pearson. Thank you. So a couple of questions, Debbie. So the CIP, you said each year, and are you talking each year or within the five-year cycle, that there will be monies that will be appropriated for just stormwater or for these retention ponds? So there is a line item in the CIP, and it says master plan implementation. And so what we do is we go through every year and we look at the master plans for the different areas and prioritize where we're seeing the most problems, the most damage. These rain gauges help us a lot. It's not just a one size fits all for the community now. We can really dial in where the big needs are. Um, and, and it's in the CIP for every year. So a second question, Mr. Mayor, is that um, with our new Skyline Trail, I went across there today and they were trying to get the mud off the road. Plus, um, flying in, you could see what the inner belt loop is going to look like, which was really kind of interesting. We need to get drone footage of that, please. It was really impressive. But so now with this large rainstorm that we had, especially with the skyline, because I know that comes off of the rims, were you able or did you look at how the water flowed through this area, how it will impact going over the rims. Were, did you see that? Mm -hmm. So this project was designed with retention ponds in it. So right. there are actually um, areas that'll hold that water and then right. slowly let it out. Okay, so that was good. It was designed. Okay. And I did notice coming down Zimmerman, there are a few more rocks that are have fallen. So that's what you're saying that you're going to look at. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Patricki. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council. Director Milling, um, so where are we with the uh, steam stormwater drainage or division? So we have a committee um, that's been working on this for the last year, and we have a recommendation and a next step that we want to take to council. We're going to do that as soon as budget gets through and approved, then we're going to be back um, to go through what our, our um, committee's recommendations are for that program. Uh, and I assume the biggest sure. difference going forward is that a year from now, if this happens again, somebody else will be sitting there <laughs> answering these questions? No, no, that's no part of it. <laughs> you know, Debbie, on that topic, kind of the 30,000-foot question is we, we know the value of uh, having um, uh, stormwater detention areas for preventing problems like this. But uh, 99 years out of 100, some of those uh, that are designed to a 100-year flood are just weed patches. And maybe more importantly, they're taking up land that could be used for housing and higher density housing. So um, is it the case that uh, we can't, one of, one of the things that is preventing us from having the same level of uh, housing density and, and commercial density 
is our requirements to have on-site detention. And in a perfect world, if we had plenty of money, we'd put it all underground and we'd build up and build more densely. How do you trade off the or, or analyze the, 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 the pros and the cons of that situation? So the regulations are not strict as far as how you have to do it, just that you have to do it. So there are places in the city that have chosen to put their water underground. And for them, it's a cost-benefit analysis of, is it, it's pretty expensive to put it underground. So is it less expensive to go underground and use that land, or is it more expensive to put a pond and actually use up land that maybe isn't as expensive? So um, we do allow certain portions of the pond to be in areas that aren't as useful. I mean, we, we try to be... Um, um, use common sense, I guess, where we put these. We want to make sure that we're not using great buildable land everywhere, but but it comes with that sometimes. Um, give you some examples of some like Ironwood, where we use swales in front yards. Uh, Reber Ranch used swales in front yards. We can do that instead of retainage areas, but then people have to actually keep them as, as swales. And uh, we've had problems um, enforcing that over the years. So there okay. are ideas we can use. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on then to our first item. Appreciate it, Debbie, and, and also appreciate your crews. We know there was a lot of overtime and hard work this weekend, so we thank you. Okay, our first item up is an uh, update from our disaster emergency services uh, coordinator uh, and designee, Anne-Marie Overcast. Uh, Anne-Marie, welcome to City Council. Take it away. Thank you, Mayor and distinguished council members for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Um, Casey is unable to join us because he had a schedule conflict for personal reasons. Um, he will be back tomorrow. So if you have any questions, hit him up. Uh, Casey and I would like to thank you guys for funding our attendance to the SEPTED training that we had 522 to 526. Commissioner Don Jones was very supportive of our attendance. However, Commissioners Osland and Morse did not support both of us attending, um, and therefore Casey was pulled after the first day of class. We wanted to make it known that both of us wanted to be there. Both of us appreciated your guys supporting us being there, but due to other uh, other input, we had to move one person out. He was very uh, disappointed that he could not attend. If you have uh, any questions or want more details as to why they did not want us both to attend, I would encourage you to reach out to Commissioners Morse and Ausland for more information. Um, as Mayor Cole said, we are going to be providing you an update based on what we talked about last time, which was a lot of our grants and a lot of our plans. So um, since we last spoke, we have applied for two Homeland Security grants. We, DES applied for $250,000 for a courthouse um, camera revamps grant, and then the BPD, with support from our office, applied for $345,000 for a night vision goggle system for city county SWAT. Um, that grant asks for 30 pairs of night vision goggles, and uh, both of those grants have made it through the state advisory council um, and have been approved, and now we're just waiting on federal approval. Um, Casey feels very confident that both grants will be approved. Um, it's very rare and uncommon for grants to get approved at the state level and then not get approved at the federal level. So our odds are fairly good on that one. Um, we will likely hear back uh, between late summer and early fall on if we got federal approval for those or, or not. Um, we have also applied for the EMPG grant for fiscal year 23-24 and are requesting the maximum amount, which is $130,000. Uh, this grant pays for half of our DES staff salaries and benefits. That says... If we're roughly running about $100,000 in salary and benefits for Casey and I, the state pays for $50,000 of that, and the county pays for $50,000 of that. Now, the county has to spend that $100,000 up front, and then they send in the receipts to the state and get that $50,000 reimbursed. So just emphasizing, the county only pays for half of our salaries and benefits. Um, this year, we are on track for using the full $130,000 and being reimbursed. So again, we are using that full $130,000 and beyond. We just can't claim the full amount because we only get $130,000. Um, in relation to our plans, we have a preliminary contingency plan uh, in the event of a BBWA ditch breach. We worked in uh, combination with the Billings Fire Department, BBWA, Billings Police Department, um, a lot of the agencies that would be involved in the response to a ditch breach. That plan has been finalized and um, has been sent out to all of the partner agencies that we would be working with. 
We are continuing to work with the Billings Fire, Billings Police, hospitals, AMR, and the airport, as well as several other agencies to develop an emergency plan for the air show that is happening in August. Should we have a bad day, like to have our ducks in a row there. So we are uh, still working closely with those partners on getting that developed and ironed out. Um, we also just completed our five-year strategic plan that will put us from fiscal year 23 to 28 as to where we want to see the department going, uh, priorities, goals, um, planning objectives, training objectives, things of that nature. Uh, I believe Wynette sent that out to the council this morning. So uh, we are wanting to get signatures from Mayor Cole and uh, Administrator Pekulski. Um, there's no, not an action item, it's just acknowledging that you got a copy of the plan. Kind of know what's it, what it's about, so. And then uh, for training, we are still working with Victoria Hill, the city PIO, to get the NIMS classes scheduled for council members and elected officials so that they know what their responsibilities are, what the terminology is, and you're not going into something going, wait, what does that stand for? What am I supposed to do? You kind of have a, a basic guideline of, of what's expected of you, what you do and don't need to do, things of that nature, who you need to call. Um, in order to receive federal funding, certain people and positions are required to have the NIMS or National Incident Management System training. And uh, some of those people include elected leadership, fire and law enforcement personnel, emergency management personnel, and pretty much anybody who would be in an EOC or expected to respond to an incident. Again, knowing that common terminology, knowing the lines that they can operate in and not operate in, things of that nature. So we are uh, excited to bring that. We're just ironing out the details and the dates and times on when and how we would do that. So, and that's our update. Very good. Thank you very much uh, for all of that. Uh, questions for Anne Marie, Council Member Puritan. So whatever you said on that training for council members, then you were then you expanded on that a bit for this federal grant. So it's not for federal grant. Um, it is a federal requirement. That, oh, federal, okay. yeah, and it's tied to grant funding. That's how they enforce it. So on all of our federal grants, we have to say are people in NIMS compliance. And so is it an either or, 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 or is it just the more people you have trained, the better, or is it certain elected officials, certain agencies? It's always the more, the better. Okay. Um, but in for federal again to be in full federal compliance, everybody. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Amber Adder, uh, with this weekend, I talked to Casey Friday afternoon about our favorite ditch, and uh, uh, I don't remember all the details, but uh, and Debbie's here. She might want to comment as well, but uh, my understanding is it's still there, so that's is, very, yes. very good. Um, uh, the rocks were fairly stable, but the, the ground was actually moving a bit. I don't know, with all this uh, saturation, do you know have, have any more information about the situation of the BBWA, especially east of 27th Street? So Friday was a very busy day for us. Uh, we had some flooding issues just for runoff, lots of rainfall, things of that nature. So we were kind of going in a couple different directions. Um, but around 5 o'clock, 4 to 5 o'clock, uh, Casey got a notification on his cell phone from the monitoring system that there was a significant change or shift, and one of the sensors noticed a 30-degree shift. And we were like, oh, crap, is that one of the big rocks? Please don't be one of the big rocks. Uh, thankfully, it was not. It was one of the smaller ones, and the hillside was just starting to uh, slough off into the ditch or erode. Um, we did get another one about four or five hours later. Um, and we were in contact with BBWA about what that was looking like. Um, Casey did meet with Alan Workman with the BBWA uh, earlier Friday to on the first one to see what's going on. Alan said, yes, it is starting to shift, but at this point it's just dirt and clay. So as long as it stays with the dirt and clay, we're not not too nervous. Um, but again, our biggest concern is, that dirt, is uh, the big rocks. So if too much comes out from underneath it, they might shift. At this point, it's just your typical erosion so we're keeping an eye on it okay thank you anything else uh, uh councilman Bernice? thank you mayor um of course i was up in the heights where the, a lot of flooding was on the west end i didn't get any alerts on my phone you, were there alerts sent out through the emergency system for those residents in the area were there many for flooding or for bbw for the flooding and roads closed things like that not on our end to to my knowledge um casey and i were, were pretty close uh, most of the weekend. 
I'm talking a lot, but we did not, to my knowledge, send out any code red um, messages regarding the flooding. Most of our messaging was done um, in tandem with Victoria Hill. We did send out a press release on Saturday uh, noting that, yes, we are aware there is flooding. Um, emergency crews are on it. Debbie, Debbie's people were out all weekend. They were doing a great job. Um, and to just kind of calm people down, like, yes, it, there is some flooding. Most of it's just a lot of water from all the rain. And please stop calling 911 unless you are at risk. Um, so yeah, that did go out to all the, the media, social media, um, but no, we did not have but a code, code red. You didn't send anything out. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Emery. Much appreciated, and um, see you in the future. Awesome. All righty. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is an opportunity for public comment uh, on this item. Is there any public comment? Uh, would anybody like to come forward? No one is, so we'll close the public comment period on item number one, move on to our budget uh, presentation wrap-up. Um, Andy, uh, uh, you're our presenter here. Uh, this is a, kind of our big item for tonight, I would say. Um, I talked to Chris a little bit. I guess it's my expectation that you're going to go through the, the 12 proposed amendments in um, brief form, kind of, and then we'll come back with any questions. And then, Council, I guess what I would suggest to us is that we move through them in order, and the default will be if we don't say otherwise, Council or uh, staff will move ahead with kind of what's laid out in our packet. But if we want to send a different direction, we'll have to communicate that. But we'll just try to go through items one through 12, unless some other better order uh, appears uh, when we get there. Does that work for you, Andy? Yes, I believe it does, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Um, except I think there are only 11 amendments. So we'll, oh, okay. we'll save well, the 12th one for you guys to yeah. come up with your own. Um, I, yeah, we may clarify kind of your comments on uh, some of that at the end. But I, I think, yeah, generally you're spot on. So th this is the FY24 budget wrap up. Um, what's up there is the uh, original proposed budget, 370.8 million uh, for FY24. Um, these next 11 slides are all a uh, combination of staff recommended, recommended amendments to the budget, as well as some uh, two budget and finance committee recommendations. Um, I, I realize it's quite a bit, and I'll try to go through it, I think, in as much detail as I can provide, and then absolutely expect uh, questions from you guys on this. Um, so these are the two budget and finance committee ones. So the, the first one here that we are recommending is uh, taking some of the unused uh, deferred fire station deferred maintenance funds that will remain unused in FY23 and recommending that they could be reallocated into FY24. Uh, that's a total of $155,000 combined with what's in the current FY24 budget would take that total to $259,600. Um, and just for why they didn't get it all spent in 23, um, one example, I believe they, they had uh, wanted contractors to come out and look at some concrete aprons. Nobody showed up for that pre-construction meeting or pre-bidding meeting. And so... You know, they didn't get that project done, but they still absolutely want to get it done. So we're requesting that those funds just be moved from one year to the next. Um, the second one here uh, is $300,000 from the general fund for planning. Uh, $200,000 for a growth policy update, and then $100,000 for Skyway Drive and interchange, I'll call them neighborhood plans. Um, the 200000 is a result of some uh, legislative changes that were made, and uh, I'm going to probably rely on Chris or Wyeth to give a lot more detail on that, but uh, we need to do significant, or we should do significant uh, update to our growth policy, and so we want to get started on that. And so we're recommending that $200,000 be uh, funded from the general fund, and the recommended funding source for that is increasing the mill levy by $200,000 so we can generate that revenue to do so. The $100,000 for Skyway Drive and Interchange uh, we're recommending come from FY23 reserves uh, that we, we believe will be generated through vacancy savings and just unused funds in FY23. Um, and the franchise fee settlement. Uh, we're recommending here that 
the $3.6 million settlement, it, it will need to be paid in fiscal year 24. Uh, so our recommendation is that we use a million dollars from the reserves, which again will be generated by unspent funds in FY23. And then we're also recommending that $2.6 million be generated from additional tax revenue in the general fund to pay this all in fiscal 24. Um, these numbers at this point are estimate because of a variety of reasons. One, we don't know what ending fund balance is going to be yet. And two, we, we, know, well, we don't know what our tax capacity or growth will be yet either. We won't know that until the first week in August, at which point we'll be able to say yes, if you levied 74 mills, here's how much tax revenue you could generate. So um, at this point, really what I'm kind of seeking guidance on or recommending to you guys is that generally this is the approach we take to paying the settlement. Final numbers probably not determined until August, though. Um, but that, that's our recommendation. Other sources for funding the settlement, you, you know, I more from the um, from the general fund reserve is an option. You could borrow funds and then pay that debt over time. Um, there you obviously have some carrying costs and debt costs that cause that to go up. I, but the other thing you could do is find reductions elsewhere to offset that as well. Um, this was not in your packet, but I wanted to share it with you uh, just so you kind of have some reference point. So 2.6 million in new tax revenue would be 9.9 .9 mills or, or based upon estimated growth. So 9.9 .9 mills to the median home is about $37. Or to a home at $516,000, that's $69. Well, why that? Because anybody who's receiving a credit on their utility bill and was a customer for all of the, the years, is it 15 through 19, I believe, and received water, wastewater, and solid waste, their credit is going to be $69. So the increase in taxes would offset anybody uh, whose home value, I'm sorry, the credit would offset anybody's increase in taxes whose home value is at 516 or less, based upon those assumptions. Is, that all will change when we get actual values, but um, just wanted to give you some frame of reference on what that means relative to the credit. Um, additionally, you heard about a request for uh, another facilities person. Um, we're recommending this be added to the budget. This is to uh, largely address projects at fire stations. Presently, that's being handled by fire personnel, and uh, the recommendation is that that we don't use fire personnel to handle those, but um, a dedicated facilities position. Um, we, the current budget has $120,000 for elections. And uh, through some correspondence with the uh, county election administrator recently, um, they informed us that the estimate for an election is about $105,000 for a citywide election. So if there is the need for a primary, there will be the need for a general, um, we won't have enough budgeted. So we're recommending that you add $125,000 to the 120 that's there to fund two elections, as well as provide some funding for printing of materials, for um, an education campaign, for, uh, for a parks bond levy, assuming that'll be happening as well. Uh, we won't know if a primary election is needed until June 19th, so that's before the June 12th meeting. That's why we're asking for that to be in here at this point in time. Um, we're recommending this, again, be funded through the reserves from FY23. I think, oh, yeah, I think that's all I had on that. All right. Uh, currently, there is an RFP process underway to uh, look at court efficiency, court space, and uh, the, the responses for that came back, at, I, I believe, around 205. So we're recommending that. And we don't know that this funding will be under contract and encumbered in this fiscal year. Given it's June 5th, anything not under contract by June 30, the budget authority goes away. And so, uh, and 
frankly, this one wasn't budgeted in FY23, um, but we were going to use funding that existed in the budget. So the recommendation here is that you add 210,000 to the FY24 budget from reserves so that this could be done. Um, it is possible that it comes before on your June 26th meeting. I, 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 I'm skeptical that it'll make it, but uh, it is possible that one's there by June 26th. Uh, we, we are recommending $120,000 for uh, SEPTED analysis and implementation in public places. This would be largely parks, but not exclusively. It would be city-owned facilities and spaces. Um, not so much the, the money is not so much needed for the analysis as much as the implementation of the recommendations, uh, whatever those may be. The recommendation here is that this comes from the uh, mental health substance abuse slash marijuana dollars. Um, you have currently in your budget $620,000 budgeted for you know, generic public safety mental health substance abuse uh, related items. So this is not an increase to the budget. What the recommendation here is that we kind of get rid of the generic uh, labeling on that 620 and specify 120 for this purpose. Uh, we're also recommending that $200,000 be set aside for um, investments in domestic violence and potentially a family justice center, but that really, uh, there's some analysis underway or barely underway at this point, won't be done until late in fiscal 24. Uh, we don't know what the results of that will be, so we're recommending that $200,000 be set aside for the potential implementation of whatever may come from that. Um, again, from the Mental Health Substance Abuse Fund uh, dollars, these would be uh, not new money, not new tax, but money that did, got, or did not get spent in FY23, uh, but we will carry forward into 24. So this would be a, an increase to the budget authority, but from funds that we've generated this year. And then... Uh, 198,966, and the reason it's not a nicely rounded 200 is because my estimate had that remaining. Um, but for nurse, nurse Family Partnership, um, if this is added to the budget, uh, we would begin discussions with Riverstone to enter into a contract to uh, provide funding from, again, the reserves from 23 that appear to be that, like they will not be spent um, so that they could uh, increase investments and re really hire more people to, to bolster up this program. Um, the assumption here is it'd be a short-term commitment. I want to be clear, it's longer term than 12 months, more than likely, um, but you know, it, it, it would result in a contract coming back to you guys for approval at some point. Um, the last two here are recommendations from the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, and so uh, this first one is to uh, eliminate PD-1 this year and then increase the general fund uh, levy by the same amount. So it's, it's no net increase to the taxpayer. They're currently paying for it through a special assessment based on taxable value. It would now result in a part of our 74 mil cap based on taxable value. Uh, it, it would, however, eat up some of that capacity that we're anticipating. So that that would be, I guess, the funding source for this one. Um, it, yeah, it, it, would, it would not be a net increase to anybody's property tax bill, though. And then on this one here, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's currently $620,000 unspecified in the mental health substance abuse marijuana funds. And uh, we recommended earlier 120,000 for SEPTED. The remaining 500,000, this recommendation comes from the committee as well to uh, allocate funding for addressing lack of jail space. Um, this would be done with some temporary uh, buildings on the jail site run by Yellowstone County. We do not have an agreement in place with them. Uh, only, I believe, preliminary discussions. But if this were included in the budget, again, like the Nurse Family Partnership, we would go forward, work out a deal, contract with them, an MOU, bring it back to you guys for approval. Um, 
I'm going to rely on Council Member Owen to maybe give more detail on this uh, since I'm woefully un unprepared for that. So that is the 11, or that are, those are the 11 recommended amendments. What that would mean, um, if you were to adopt a budget and then include all of those amendments, your total budget would go from that left column at 370.8 million. It would increase by $9 million to 379, or th yeah, 379.9 million. You can see the upper portion, the revenue there, uh, shows a tax increase of 6.7 million, a special assessment reduction of 3.8 million, and then a transfer of 4.1 million. And that would be largely the transfer from general fund into what is today Park District 1 fund. And so we would, we would just generate the money in the general fund, transfer it into Park District 1 fund where it could be held so that those park projects could be completed. And I have it detailed broken out if we want to look at each individual one as well. So there are a few items there uh, that were recommended to be funded through general fund balance, or yeah, general fund fund balance. So our estimate right now is that FY23 fund balance will end at $3 million above the minimum reserve. So when I take those items out that we were recommending, the fire station deferred maintenance, 100000 for planning, election fees, court analysis, that's $590,000. From that remaining fund balance, that would leave you with $2.4 million. What I don't have up there is the franchise fee settlement which I'm recommending at a million, but I want you to be aware there's potential capacity to use more fund balance still staying above your minimum reserve. The reason I'm recommending a million is because our reserve is a minimum reserve and it is just that. Um, in fact, on Friday, our general fund was negative cash because we today or late Friday afternoon got our first large tax payment for May. So. For a little bit there, we had negative cash. So your minimum fund balance is, again, truly that minimum fund balance. I would recommend to you that you strive to keep it above that slightly and maybe even increase it over time. Um, and that's why I'm recommending a million, but I, I just want you to be aware there is some capacity to go beyond that at this time. Um, here again, that's that $3 million, is, it's my estimate based upon where we were, I don't know, 30, 60 days ago and kind of what trends we're looking like. It, it'll be different than that, but I, I wouldn't imagine it'll be grossly different than that. And then in the mental health substance abuse funds, uh, here again, there was a recommendation to use some fund balance from 23 in 24. And uh, I'm just showing here, we, we're estimating that the ending fund balance in that fund will be $300,000, the budget with two full mills in there and the $620,000 as well as the crew, there's actually about $98,000 or $100,000 more in revenue than there were in budgeted expenses. So what I'm recommending you use those dollars for, I guess I really shouldn't have had the 120 on there, but it works out. So I'm, I'm recommending then that, I guess, this is to illustrate why I got to 198,966. That's really the point of this. So we would, if we spent every dollar in this fund in fiscal 24, we would end at $0. Um, this one, this slide here is to show the uh, recommended tax revenue increases. Uh, I'll handle the $65,000 one first. So if you looked in the budget book, you may have noticed the tax revenue in the um, Actually, you would have had to look at, I believe, one of the questions and answers that was sent out in the weekly. I'd broken down the this fund specifically for you guys upon your request. And at that time, I noticed we did not have a full two mils of revenue estimated in there. And it was about $65,000 short. So if you levied the full two mils for that, it would go up by $65,000. That's what that one is. The 6.623 is the... Uh, Park District one dollars, the settlement dollars, and the two hundred thousand for planning. That is above 
the capacity estimate at a 19% growth. We estimated you'd have about $6 million in capacity at 19% growth. So in order to do all this, we would need approximately 24% growth. So you may be thinking, well, how's that possible? Well, one, the preliminary estimates for Yellowstone County are 29% growth. Now that's countywide. Historically, we are slightly less than the county. We don't know, again, what that actual increase will be until August. Um, so our recommendation at this point is that, again, going back, I guess in my mind, the settlement's really the largest question on how to handle, handle it. Um, certainly you guys may disagree with that, but um, my general recommendation at this point is to get feedback or desire from you guys is to get feedback on how you want to handle it. And then in August, when we have taxable value, we have a better understanding of where our ending fund balance was, we can say, yep, that's, this is consistent with the plan if it's fund balance and tax or if it's fund balance and borrowing. This is consistent with what we wanted to do and here's my recommendation on how we, how we scale those two. Um, but really what I'd like to see is yeah, direction on how to handle those. So with all of that, um, what would the median homeowner see? They would see a $97 increase in their annual tax bill. This is about a 10% increase over the prior year. Um, so certainly not uh, pretty large relative to what we've seen in the past. Um, but you know, the CPIU, I think over 2022 was, uh, I believe, six and a half to nine percent or something like that, or around about eight percent over the year. Um, and again, that's all based on a 19 percent uh, increase in value. Uh, this slide, I, don't know, I thought it looked a lot better on the other version, but that's all right. Uh, the, this slide here would be an update to staffing. So one thing I haven't mentioned is the library has decided that or they, they originally were recommending that we get rid of the private security contract and move to two FTEs to provide the security services at the library. Uh, since the proposed budget, they're actually saying, hey, we, we really don't think that's the direction we want to go right now. And so we're asking that we remove that. It's, it's not a change in the total budget dollars for the library, though, because it would just now go back to being private contract security. Um, and then additionally, it shows the, the request for that facilities, uh, the additional facilities position. So it would be a total of 14 FTEs. These slides do not include the five transit FTEs that were part of the long range uh, transportation plan, nor does it include the uh, 13 public works positions that were con converted to full time. Because uh, those happened in FY23. So, um, I have one more slide after this that I added, but uh, really, how do you guys want to handle the settlement payment? You now, that's kind of one of the directions we want to move forward for or move, move forward with. Um, a reminder, actual taxable value isn't going to be here until the first week of August. We have budget hearings scheduled on June 12th, and then, if needed, on June 26th as well. Um, and I think maybe to clarify perhaps what you said at the beginning, Mayor, I wasn't sure if I heard you correctly, but our recommendation and what is on the packet right now is the original budget that was brought to you in May, that $370 million budget. So here it is. So our, our recommended procedure going forward is that on June 12th, you guys you know, we have a presentation, you have public comment, discussion, and then you make motion to adopt the original $370.8 million budget, then make motions for amendments, and then on or around 7.30, as we approach that break, um, if you guys feel like, hey, we really want to, we, we do want to take this into another meeting, then somebody makes a motion to continue the hearing to June 26th. If you feel like, hey, we're, we're ready to wrap it up and adopt it, you certainly have that opportunity on the 12th as well. If you do uh, continue on to June 26th, that meeting, um, I'll, be a, I'll give you a short presentation on, hey, here's where we started, here's where you guys ended that June 12th meeting, 
and then turn it over to you to begin making amendments again. Um, I would imagine you'd want to probably have public comment at that as well. And then you can make motions for amendments and adoption at that meeting as well. That's the general recommendation going forward for uh, the next two meetings related to the budget. And I did check today, this morning. I don't think there were any council amendments entered online. Um, but if you would like to do that, that option's available for you. Um, and I think, unless you want to go through some, this is the detail of those individual budget amendments. It's way too much for the screen. But if you have specific questions on how we got to the, the summary totals that I showed earlier, I've got it broken out there, and then funding sources. Um, but Mayor, I'll turn it over to you, uh, committee members, whomever you'd like to hand it to for further discussion. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for your uh, hard work and lots of spreadsheets here, which we appreciate. Uh, obviously, a lot of work goes into this, uh, uh, not just you, but uh, everybody in your office. Um, let me first ask, uh, is there anybody in the office, or in the office, uh, in the chambers who would like to make public comment? Because once we get into questions, we, that may get lost. So uh, let's open for public comment um, on these proposed budget amendments. Is there anybody with us who would like to make public comment before we close public comment on this period? Not seeing anybody, so we'll go ahead and close the public comment period. Um, uh, Council, let's try to stick to as much as we can. Factual questions for Andy first, and then we'll get into broader uh, opinions because it's going to be tough to draw those lines, I know. Um, uh, but, <clears throat> and then I will just start uh, maybe one end with as factual questions as we can. Um, I'll just start with one, Andy. The, the 9696 so $97 net increase to homeowner of uh, median value home with uh, the proposal that you've just laid out with the 11 different amendments. Um, that 96.96 is gross before taking into account the one year utility credits, right? And based on what you sh said before, somebody with a uh, $500,000 house would get about $70 worth of credit. Uh, somebody, well, actually, everybody would get an equal amount, right? So um, you'd have to knock off, if you're just looking at uh, the actual impact in that one year, about $70. Is that fair? Yes, Mayor, that is correct. This is only the tax bill. Um, and the, the homeowner who is a utility customer for all of the time frame that is required and was a customer of all three utility services regardless of the value of their home, uh, could receive up to $69 of credit on their utility bill. Okay, thank you. And not, not everybody would fall in that category, but a lot of people would, of course. course. Should we just start down here and we'll just work our way uh, down for questions for Andy? Or sure. other staff members and just, uh, we, we have uh, many of these proposals impact other departments and many of those department heads or others are with us today. Uh, Council Member Gillick? Yeah, I guess probably a question for Andy. Um, uh, item number three was the franchise fee uh, settlement. Um, just get, do we know have an estimate of what the financing cost would be if we were to spread it out three years, something like that? Is there is there an easy way to give it, get a sense of that? Um, you know, I don't know offhand. I I would probably recommend that we just go to the state uh, state revolving fund and. They have a variable rate um, interest, and I, I, I don't know what it is right now, but um, it's, it's generally market, so it's not real low. But five to seven percent, if you're wondering what not real low is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good? I can follow up. I you can come back. Okay. So. Councilor Bernice? I'll pass. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Bernice? Andy, did you want to finish something up? I'll, I'll follow up in, with more precise information and email to you guys tomorrow on that, though. So, yeah, that's all. I, just, I wanted to ask sort of a, a similar question on this kind of strategy of how we approach this funding the settlement. Potentially, there could be $2 million in change, but that would take us down to minimum reserve levels, right? Correct. And I just want to make sure I understand the, the implications here. It sounds to me, based on what you said about Friday, that there are two main issues council needs to consider when it comes to reserves. One is an, an emergency, something where we just have an unexpected need that has to be addressed. But two, it sounds like there's a cash flow question, too. Is that correct? Yeah, I, 
I think your minimum reserves are largely, almost exclusively driven off of cash flow needs. Okay. Not considering emergency needs. Okay. Because it seems like conceivably if, if we could bond this amount with our sort of limited bonding authority, we could also hold that bond capacity to respond to the emergency. But it, it seems like the more important issue is cash flow. Am I correct? In my opinion, yes. Uh -huh. but, yeah. Generally, emergencies funded from the general fund in the past five, seven years have been related to large rock falls in the parks. That, I mean, because that's, uh, yeah, that's largely where we've had to address that from is general fund. Okay. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Actually, my question is to um, uh, two of the proposals are from the committee, subcommittee. So I have the question for the subcommittee members. I was wondering when you uh, have a proposal for the um, mis uh, jail space for misdemeanor offenses, I was wondering if uh, the sheriff had come in and made any presentation or as uh, Director Friday had said, this will have to come back to council and more specifics would be would be necessary and an agreement would be necessary. I was just wondering if any on the committee had actually spoken to the sheriff about this proposal. Thank you. So we've got uh, several members. We'll probably turn it over to uh, Council Member Owen the or Deputy other Mayor members. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Council Member uh, Boyack, can you answer Council Member Joy's question? Um, I met with uh, the three commissioners and the sheriff, an under sheriff, at their last meeting. I guess it was that Monday or Tuesday, and uh, I brought up this topic, and they all were very interested in, in, interested in that. There's nothing definite. There's no dollar amount. There's no size. There's no nothing, but. I was just happy that they were saying, yeah, let's look at that. Could I, uh, respond, as, could I sure. respond as well? So I think um, this will probably need a lot more discussion, and I don't want to go too deep into beyond what question that's been asked. Um, I likewise have spoken to the sheriff about it. Uh, I think we've heard here on council repeatedly um, from our own police chief that we do have this need for a very short term sort of overnight holding. Um, I think what we're hearing from the county commission is they're reluctant at this point to move forward on bricks and mortar. So this type of portable facility is an interim solution while we assess broader facility needs, hopefully in conjunction. What the sheriff indicated to me is that this type of facility he believes could fit on the property, could be kept safe, and through a contract could be managed. So um, there is an openness to this conversation from the sheriff that I have heard as well as what um, Council Member Boyette has heard. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a follow up. Sure. Uh, were these discussions in public? Uh, I think Council Member Boyette's was, um, and mine was a, a phone call with the sheriff. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Andy, the, uh, there are about one, a little over a million dollars of potential funding from the uh, mental health, substance abuse, marijuana, crime prevention pot. Um, and um, uh, uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, or is it the case from a timing perspective that although we need to know how much of those dollars might be spent, in the budget, the exact allocation to project A and B, but not C or D, um, is not something that we are facing the usual June 30th deadline about. Is that correct? Because my gut is there's a lot of balls up in those errors or in that error, and we may need time to, to uh, sort that out after June 30th. What's your reaction? Sure. Um, I think generally you're correct. The The two items that are not budgeted are the, um, the, the $200,000 set aside and the nearly $200 for Nurse Family Partnership. So th those are presently not in the budget. So if you wanted to create authority to spend that, i.e. direction for staff to start pursuing those, uh, I would recommend you add three hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars to the FY twenty-four budget, not revenue, just on the expenditure side. The other two items, though, there is six hundred twenty thousand dollars budgeted for that generic purpose. 
certainly if you adopted the budget today as is, that would remain in there, the specific purposes to be determined. Okay, and, and these could be added to the generic pot. They don't have to be specifically identified by target, right? Uh, absolutely. Right. You could just say take that 620 and make it, uh, what, 300 and, well, I'm not even going to do the math, 700 and something there. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Councilor Trichy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to follow up on that thought, I, I am fine with leaving it generic. I would like the subject area to be um, family violence, domestic violence, because I do believe that that's our biggest area that we need to um, address right now. So following up on the mayor's first question, um, so if I understand what you're saying right, um, with the $70 removed from Hauser, the actual increase to the median household payment is $26? Um, I, I think you could, look, you could look at it that way. The, okay. the credit will be on a utility bill, though, and this, not, yeah. this will be on the tax bill. Yeah. But $70 of that increase is the payment for Hauser? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, just another thing, just uh, just a quick report, actually. Um, I ran into Senator Friedel the other day. It was right after the announcement was made about the uh, county commissioners not being um, on board with the study. And he said that um, he is very interested in, in bringing the state to that table and having it be a state, county, city kind of thing, which ultimately it, it really, really needs to do, be. The only other thing I wanted to share is apparently the independent audit of the crisis center um, showed a huge fiscal gap. And as a result of that, um, money that was being targeted from the county's mental health um, mill levies are now being directed towards that. And um, these are two of the programs that are being being cut. Um, I will put a budget amendment in there um, um, in order to include them. At this point, I don't have enough information to know how much I would, whether I would support it or not. Um, but um, it's one of them is Head Start is a Head Start program, and the other one is the continuation of a project that's going on with the COC. So, so I'll add that to the budget stuff um, as we go forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member, thank you for the good news. Council Member Um uh, Council Member Tidswell. I'm good, thank you. Council Member Pierrington. <coughs> okay, this is where I'm confused. So we've got $620,000 in the two mil levy. How much do we have in the marijuana? So that those are combined together. The, the two mills by themselves will generate um, $520,000, $530,000. And then um, I believe we're estimating around three seventy to 400000 for marijuana. So we've kind of looked at the, I mean, from my perspective, Andy, we've looked at these in different buckets, but yet now we combine the buckets into this dollar amount. Is that true? Am I looking at this correctly? I have always viewed them in the same bucket to fund the same types of things. Um, I think there may be some debate about that. Um, my understanding was that it was going to be that the mill was going to be coupled with the marijuana dollars to address similar types of issues. So we have tracked them together. Um, so when a dollar gets spent from that, we don't really know if it's a dollar from marijuana or a dollar from the mill, but it's a dollar from that pot for those purposes. And that's the way we've tracked it. At one point, I think, I think you were the one that made the, the statement, oh, we got someone waiting. They're excited. <laughs> so I thought that and maybe it wasn't you that said you weren't sure, confident that the money that we were getting from the county 
for the marijuana money was figured correctly. Have you sorted that out? So I'm, I'm confident that they were figuring it the way they thought it was correct. correct. Um, the state legislature did uh, clarify the language for marijuana allocation to be in line with the way I thought it should have been for the benefit of the city. What that means is the city will receive uh, approximately $200,000 more per year in marijuana revenue than we had in the prior year. The reason that the dollars going into this pot of money is still the same generally as last year is because we are taking 200000 of that total and putting it towards the new city hall right. to be named building. And that, but that's consistent with the funding program for, uh, that we had brought to you guys for gotcha. that project. So we don't get money back that we didn't um, get? Have you there, was, there was no provisions for uh, <laughs> reclawing. I did encourage the county to uh, correct the calculation sooner than October 1st which is the statutory start date, I, I don't know if they will. Okay. Um, so I think that's my, this is where I, get, I do get confused with that. So at this point, the full amount between the mill levy and the marijuana money, we're, I mean, this is where your proposal is in the budget, is that it goes towards the 500K for the jail if, I mean, to me, that's kind of pie in the sky right now because we don't know if that's going to happen. So we're going to keep that there, and, and I think it's a great idea. And then the 120 is for the nurse family practitioner program. Is that correct? Uh, no. No, not not exactly. I don't have it all up here, but I will give you the best I can. So there it is. the items budgeted from that pot of money are first the crisis response units crew, and I want to say there's probably. 200,000 to 225 budgeted for that program. That's staffing two positions and equipment. And then there would be, you know, if you took this proposal as is, there'd be $500,000 for lack of jail space, oh, 100 and, for 120 for SEPTED, 200 for domestic violence, and another 200 for NFP. Okay, thank you. Yep. Councilor Boyad. Thank you, Mayor. Andy, you and I talked the other day. Uh, if you use 9.9 .9 mills out of the increase to pay for the uh, 3.8 million, that's a one-time deal though, correct? That's what I would recommend, yes. We don't need to levy for another settlement. Okay, then how do we turn around the next year and stop levying that? Is, is there a mechanism that we can say, we put it in place that says next year after it's done, we won't collect this, or do we have to come back to the council and re-vote on it? Yeah, I, mills, are set every year, so you guys set them every year. I, I don't know how you could bind next year's council to do such a thing, but um, certainly some of you will be here, maybe all of you, next year, so that, that opportunity would be before you at that point in time. Okay, and then one more. So then we have the, the MRU and the CRU, Mobile Response Unit and Crisis Response Units, you probably can't answer this, but that means that the people who at the fire department used to go out on the calls aren't going to be going out on the calls. Does that make sense? So, so the mobile response team, I believe, will reduce the number of calls that the fire department is, well, was going on, but the um, MRTs would be going on. The, the crisis response units, I don't, I don't know, Chris, I don't believe those will reduce the number of calls that they'd be responding to because I'm not sure that they respond. Well, I don't know, actually. I'll stop talking. Yeah. I thought we hired people, extra people for both of them. This is Councilmember Boyette, Mayor and Council. Over the long term, as they fully are utilized, the expectation is that you would, if not reduce the number of calls, you'd reduce the time that law enforcement on, on the behavioral health, mental health partnership with, with um, Rimrock, that actually is expected to most impact law enforcement, whereas the medical response time, medical response teams are absolutely reducing the number of calls that we're rolling trucks to out of the stations. So then they're in a better position and are, I would anticipate, I mean, data is still being collected and will always be collected, 
you should see reduced response times to both. When a medical call is coming in, it should be quicker for the smaller unit to respond to that need for call. And since they're out on that call, when the big emergency comes in with the fire or the need for the equipment on a terrible traffic accident, you should see a reduced response time there as well because that unit is not interrupted by these medical calls. So yes, uh, overall some reduction in calls, definitely reduction in rolling of the engines, not necessarily reduction of responding to calls for service, but a more efficient delivery of those services for both police and fire. So I guess my real question was, Item number four was uh, increase uh, another FTE for 85000 If we're going to save that much, if we can save personnel and time, couldn't we not make that up by not hiring a person, letting the, the excess go to that? You, you probably won't be able to answer that, but that was my question. Okay. Um, Councilman Ripsis. Thank you, Mayor. Andy, um, next year on the, can we go back to the median slide? <clears throat> so next year, uh, um, to, to somebody's point, um, our, our mills won't have to be as high because we won't have the 2.6 million for the house or so. And so that's what about 10 mills, which is 263 per, right? So, or, or 375 per mill, so $37 for the median. So we would expect that 277.52 to come down by about $37 next year. All things staying the same, which there's no reason this budget would be different from next year's, right? Right. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so it's not really, we won't really see it go down by $70 next year, but half of that uh, is what we might expect. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. The other th thing I wanted to ask about is the the reserves. We set those based on a a certain target percent of the general fund and public safety. So or how does that? Set? Yeah, your your reserve policy is twenty nine percent of the general fund budgeted expenditures minus capital. So there's actually no public safety amount reserved, but for the amount we transfer from the general fund, we. That goes into that 29% calculation. So this this budget actually shifts more of the public safety to that public safety fund as opposed to we're reducing the, the transfer out of the general fund, right? Do we need to revisit that calculation of what our reserve should be? It sounds like you were floating a check here last week and oh. do we need to do we need to tweak that as we see more of it moving into the public safety fund as opposed to general fund? So you are correct. Yes, the, the total dollar amount of reserves actually went down for 24, or is estimated to go down for 24 because that transfer is going down. Um, so yeah, I think that for that reason and just purely for cash flow reasons, I think it would be wise to revisit that. Not as part of the budget, but certainly keeping that in mind as you go forward with the budget. Um, but we might want to consider that as we decide how much of that reserves, those excess reserves to, to use this next year, right? Yeah. So if you, if you looked at the general fund budget page, you would see that we have an ending FY23 fund balance of 3037000 And then the proposed budget, general fund, revenue and expenses are nearly identical. But then the ending fund balance above minimum is actually 3.4 million. And that's because of that overall reduction in the re recommended minimum. The reason I didn't start with 3.4 is because I, it's only going down because that transfer reduced. It's not going down because our expenses went down. Does that make sense? So I, yes, I think you should revisit it. Um, this though I think has $400,000 of potential cushion for that transfer portion. Does that make sense? Okay. So and you're then, not worried for this year, but for not, the next budget cycle, maybe we would see an, an adjusted yeah, I, what, where we think that reserve should be. Yeah, I would continue for as long as I'm here to encourage you to keep adding to those reserves to a point that's you know reasonable. My estimation is probably 
taking 29 up to 35% or somewhere around there. It's, it's not a significant increase to get there, but I think that would be prudent from a cash flow perspective. And then taking into consideration what potential emergencies we think we may see in the next you know, five, 10 years, however long you really, what your risk appetite is for holding on to money for that eventual emergency. And to, to be clear, we didn't have to float checks. We, have, we do have plenty of cash at the city, <laughs> only in the general fund. And, and we ended the day with positive cash. It was fine, but just I, I wanted to be clear that it's not, it's not an overly uh, aggressive minimum fund balance that you have. Okay, thank you. Well, Council, uh, we've had a good, good round of uh, factual question. Very um, uh, appreciate everybody focusing there. Um, we still need to give direction on these 11 items. And so uh, I guess what I would propose is we just take them in order. We try not to have a 10 or 15 minute conversation about each one because by the time you multiply by 11, we'd be here for several hours from there. Um, I may, I don't want to be pushy, but if something seems fairly non-controversial, I may say that and kind of direct, you know, does anybody want to object to whatever default I throw out there? Um, anybody want to talk about process before we just start on to these items? Councilmember Bowen? Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to suggest as an alternative, if we can dispense with non-controversial ones tonight, that might be great, but some of these might need more discussion and work. I mean, we might want to spend tonight working and discussing on some of the more complicated ones and then consider adopting amendments next week since we do have that time on two um, actual official business meetings and because council member Shaw is not here and able to, to share her opinion. An alternative, um, we, if like I said, if there's quick ones we can dispense of, great, but we might want to work on some of the more complicated or controversial ones and try to line up votes for next week. Sure, and I, and I didn't mean to suggest that we would not dig into um, the complicated ones, just trying to separate the sheep from the goats on, I guess. Um, uh, Councilor Bernice, Councilor Retreaky. I think we should just run through one at a time. If we feel one needs more uh, discussions, we just defer it until the next next meeting. Okay, Councilor Patricki. I was going to say, let's just go through it once. If there's no opposition, then, you know, we'll go back through it again with the ones that have opposition and however far we get by 730, that's as far as we get. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, just but start going one after the yeah, other. If, there, if there's no opposition to number one, yeah. then we say fine. If there's some opposition to number two, then we defer, go to three, see if there's opposition and then come back okay. and look at the so ones not to get, that have opposition. Um, log, uh, 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 bogged down. So yeah. if that's okay with everybody, we'll just try to go through and identify the uh, low-hanging fruit. Um, number one, uh, my suspicion is one of those ripe apples that is okay. Um, Councilmember Bernice is uh, shaking his head, but go ahead. Uh, it, so let's uh, item number one, comments. Yeah. So my, my only c c comment on this and question is I understand, I mean, if they couldn't get the work done last year and you got the, all, all this, this work continued to pile up in deferred maintenance, now we're going to double the amount and expect double the work to get done. I'm not so sure that, you know, I haven't heard a plan that this is, they, they have the capacity to even get this done. So we're going to throw more into the budget and yet not, we don't know if it's going to, the work's going to get done. And so that's my concern is we're just going to throw more money into the pot and yet they can't spend it. They couldn't spend it last year. And now we're going to throw more money into the pot and they, are they going to be able to spend it this coming year to get the deferred maintenance done? Uh, is there anybody with us who can comment on that? They're not huge dollars, but I don't know what the situation was in the last year. John? Good evening, Mayor Council. Thank you for that question, Council Member nee. So <clears throat> we were trying to push to get some projects done. By the end of this fiscal year, we had a vacancy in the facility specialist position, which is dedicated towards fire department and a manage projects for them. But we had that position that was not filled for roughly five and a half months. So a lot of that work fell onto me. And I didn't move as quick as I could have just because of the capacity issues with New City Hall and some of the other items. So I feel confident that if we do defer these funds, we can get those projects done. We have those bid packages and everything else lined up. It's just a matter of drumming up that interest in those projects and making sure we get vendors to bid on the work. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, Pastor Rowan. Thank you, Mayor. So um, in the budget committee process, there are quite a few amendments that are coming up tonight that we didn't get a chance to review. This is one of them. However, we did discuss this in committee and um, had asked Chief Valdez, you know, about the amount of deferred maintenance. There is quite a bit of deferred maintenance in the fire department. I think that's been identified. Um, and the recommendation for the fire department is they believe they could about handle $300,000 a year. Um, I think Council Member Boyette or, or Gulick can chime in. So the committee didn't was didn't have an opportunity even to make a recommendation on this amendment, but three hundred thousand was about the amount that was sort of informally discussed. Okay, Council Member Gulick. I would just add that uh, I think it's Fire Station One. I mean, there's some anecdotes from that uh, of just windows that are uh, you know completely failure. I mean, like uh, yeah, car carpet failing. Uh, if there's if there's um, the the utilities are probably astronomical. The uh, having to wear coats uh, winter, in the winter uh, in their offices, that kind of thing. So, okay, thank you. All right. The, again, the, the default was proceed with this item unless somebody makes a motion to the contrary or takes a different direction. I'm not seeing that, so I guess scratch or check or something like that. <laughs> Uh, item, item number two, uh, the planning funds, $200,000 for uh, growth policy beefing up and $100,000 for that Skyway Trail neighborhood plan. Um, again, I think that's probably going to get approval, but uh, feel free to speak or against it or to modify. Councilmember Boyette. Um, Andy, again, the, the, the state is... Uh, came up about and said we needed to do some more planning and this is a result of that that 200,000 I'm going to defer to Chris or Wyeth on this one on what the state said exactly I'll keep it brief and Wyeth can back anything up I want I want to be careful to this is not a finger pointing at the state planners builders contractors were asking the state to make these changes but yes now that it's in statute we do have a clock that's ticking. We have a growing community. And so, yes, we believe we need to get moving on the housing analyses, some private contracts, and work for long-range planning for you and future councils to adopt a new growth policy to be in compliance with statute. We believe $200,000 will get us there. It is identified as reoccurring because though the growth policy won't reoccur every year, long-range planning needs in our community reoccur. That's why we split the two, the recommendation on the 200 as mill levy and the 100 as a one-time expense as using cash reserve. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Bernice. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and this may be for YF. Um, <clears throat> YF, we've done a lot of studies on the Skyway, Interbelt Loop, Skyway Drive, the... I th I'm assuming the interchange is the, the uh, bypass. What is this extra $100,000 plan going to do, it, and what, why is it needed? Um, Council Member Renice, Mayor and Council. Yeah, a couple of clarifications, I guess, just an explanation. Um, so there's several things going on here. We have the inner belt loop, that corridor, and doing what I wouldn't call it a neighborhood plan. It's an area plan. It's really to look at. We did the corridor study, as you pointed out, from for the inner belt loop corridor itself. Um, we need to now drill in further than, that was a transportation MPO funded corridor study. You can only go so far with the land use aspects of that and other elements. So this is to move us to the point of being able to take, look at market, you know, demand, economic development issues, zoning, land use, what, like, what would we see get built in that area? What type of zoning would support that? And then also dovetail that with public works to look at then what the utility implications are. So that's what that is addressing specifically. And it's actually, that 100,000 is for two studies. It's the inner belt loop corridor. And then um, to look at the north bypass that we did, the, we just, you just recently adopted the corridor study for the north end of the bypass coming into the heights. It's to do the similar type of drill down in that area to look at those same elements um, and then be able to look at utility planning and stuff. So it's basically covering both of those. Okay, Mayor, quick follow up on that. So at the end of these studies, we we would have a plan of what the zoning would be. Uh, would there anything? If I, I, I guess I relate this to kind of what was done on the Shiloh. There's a Shiloh overchain overlay, it, it, where there are certain pro, um, certain ways you had to develop the land. So at the end of this study, it, is that what we're going to see? You would basically you'd end up with recommended yeah like what land uses what zoning types would work for the type of development that's expected to go there and then you would have like a future land use map 
that would work with that. The, the idea with, the, the, as an example, with the North Bypass piece is to dovetail that with the Heights Neighborhood Planning effort that we're gonna do because we'll be looking at the same things regarding land use and, and zoning and uh, development there. So we would do that and it would give you that same information. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, anything else, oh, Council Member uh, Pearson? So, um, and I don't know who can address this, but my concern is, is that we're using that $100,000 out of general fund reserves. If we decide to use those reserves for something else, say the, the settlement, then where would that put that $100,000? Are we not collecting fees in planning that could be used to do some of this? Councilmember Perrington, I hear two questions there. One would be for Andy to pull up the sheet to show you, yes, we, we, we this 100,000, where the anticipated end of year cash reserve is, assumes that this 100 is taken out. So if the 100 isn't, then that 2.447 number becomes 2.547. That's how that would adjust there. And then I'm sorry, I lost your, you had a second question there, I think. About fees. Yeah. Oh, fees. fees. So planning fees absolutely cover the planning review and analysis of applications, but they don't cover long range planning efforts for the community and the, for the community. So your, your neighborhood plans, I mean, and your growth policy updates are not being paid for out of planning fees for projects. That's being covered by, I guess, the 1.3 mills that's levied across the county, including the city. So just a follow up. So since we're so far behind on our neighborhood plans, yep. in fact, we don't do them. That's basically what has happened with that. And now with the growth policy, because we I think over the past few years, it's just been handled within the department. It hasn't really come to the public. It hasn't really come to the city council, I don't think. Uh, so I can see with that growth policy, and it may be completely, the policy may look completely different than what the one we currently have. So how are we generating, how do we know it's going to cost $200,000? So I'm going to let um, Wyeth handle the number, and I will say at the, pol at the administrative policy level, it's why I recommended we actually add mills, because I think, we, I know, based on the history of updating neighborhood plans and the desire to do better land use planning, particularly at the edges of the city, we need to be doing planning year in and year out, long range planning year in and year out, not just when a neighborhood plan expires or the growth policy expires, but Wyeth can tell you why we got to 200,000. Okay, just to follow up to what you just said, though, you said we add mills. Yes. Now, we're capped at 74 mills. Yep. Where are you adding those mills? We are below the cap. I mean, the proposed budget did not include the payment of the settlement, and it did not include the transfer of Park District 1 out of, we did not sunset it yet. We still have another fiscal year we could do that. The budget and finance re committee recommendation was to do that this year. If neither of those things were to happen, we would be 24 mills under our cap is what the proposed budget was before resolving these issues. So we're using up some of that capacity in a variety of what we've shown you tonight. Um, yep. Yes, uh, Mayor and Council. So, yeah, the, our estimate for the for the actual whole um, implementation of the Montana um, Land Use Planning Act, which is that S Senate Bill 382, is to there, there's a whole bunch of elements in that, and I'm happy to share more of that in detail with you. But you have to um, develop a public participation plan for how you're going to do the entire update. Uh, you have to do uh, housing analysis, which we have not ever done to the level that's now expected in the statute regarding uh, housing. You, you literally figure out what your housing needs are, what's your, your gap, and then how you're going to um, zone and prepare your, your, develop, your community to be able to um, provide that capacity. You do future land use mapping for the entire um, city. Um, then you also incorporate your transportation plan, your CIP, um, your utility planning and that information, which you don't have to redo those plans, but you have to take that information and inform how that 
um, helps you uh, figure out your comprehensive planning and your long-term planning effort. So basically, we looking at all those elements and, and knowing that we're going to have staff, but also we're going to need some consultant assistance as well uh, for some of this analysis. That's basically how we arrived at the $200,000 estimate. We did, just as an example, our zoning code update. We ended up um, ultimately spending $160,000, and we barely, um, that was pretty tight to get that completed. Now that was city and county, but that was a few years ago. And that was just looking at the zoning, not trying to bring in these other things. So we want to make sure we've, we've got all those pieces and we can use our other studies to help inform that. So. Okay. Thank you. Question for you while we've got you, Wyeth, following up on a question, I think from our, my last, our last minute I, they asked, just to confirm again that the cost of services study <laughs> is already built in and uh, we don't have to, uh, worry about ignoring that because it's already built into the budget. Correct. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, back to this uh, council. Um, are we good to give staff the green light on number two? I'm seeing nodding heads. I'm seeing thumbs up. Not seeing anybody jumping up and down shouting. So uh, council or hopefully somebody's making notes to that effect. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are keeping track, Mayor. But right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andy. A week from tonight or the following, an amendment will need to be brought forward for each of these by you to get them approved. But essentially, you're giving each other the clarity as to where you want to go with each of the amendments. Yep. Thank you. Okay, next item up, uh, franchise fee uh, payment uh, for the settlement, which does have to uh, be paid out in fiscal year 24 uh, million dollars from reserves and 2.6 approximately uh, from increased uh, tax revenue um, uh, that's anticipated. Uh, any concerns, suggestions, Council Member uh, Joy? Oh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted kind of to ask uh, uh, Director um, Zeller how the two look. If you take number 10, eliminate Parks District 1, and, um, and the franchise fee settlement of 3.0, and you look at it in terms of our use of reserves, how could that look if, if we weren't um, eliminating Park District 1 and replacing it with general funds, but instead um, you really um, kind of considered the franchise fee settlement and waited one year to do that? Or is it possible to wait one year to do that? I guess maybe that's the first question. Thank you. Yes, it is possible to do that. Um, Park District 1 doesn't expire until December of 2024, so you have the entirety of fiscal 24 to you know, function status quo. So th that option does exist, but it, it was not the recommendation of the committee, and therefore it's, it's up here as well. Um, excuse me, just clarifying. Um, what does that, how, how's that impacting our reserves if we're instead of eliminating Park 1, waiting a year, how does that um, impact our settlement and our, our, our re, um, reserves? Thank sure. you. So, so I don't think um, moving Park District 1 has any impact on reserves because um, we're just, there's no use of reserves for that. Um, with respect to the franchise fee settlement, the, the only impact I would say it has is assuming you actually realize only 19% growth in taxable value, you don't have enough tax revenue to do all of that. 19% um, is a conservative estimate. Um, so may that number be 24? I think it's, it's entirely possible. Um, but based upon our estimates right now, yeah, you'd be um, you're running out of tax revenue at this point. Just to follow up, Mayor. Go ahead. And um, we won't know that number in term until August 1st, right? So we will be adopting a budget based on a plan of paying the franchise fee without being sure that we're going to have something above that 19% increase in taxable value. Is that correct? Correct. If you adopt it as is here, that, that is correct. Uh, Council Member Denise, Council Member Owen, or however you want to, Council Member Owen. I, I just want to follow up on that point. Andy, what you're saying is based on the assumption that we only use $1 million in FY23 reserves, right? 
Correct. And there is more than that that could be used. Yes, if you chose to, if you got, if you realized 19% growth and said, hey, we want to levy at the cap, and it really was only 19%, we would probably look to shift, rather than a million out of reserves, a million point, or 1.7 million, because that would be the deficit from that we wouldn't realize in tax revenue. And that would still leave us slightly above minimum reserves. Very slightly, yes. I know, Andy. I know your <laughs> mental health is resting on a thread here. <laughs> Council Member Nace. Thank you, Mayor. Andy, I guess the question I have is um, if we were to adopt the budget and, you, and the reserves were so skinny that we had to do something for your mental health, could, couldn't we then borrow some funds to make sure our, our reserves were sufficient? And what's the maximum amount we can borrow? Um, so yes, you could borrow funds to maintain a reserve level that you felt appropriate. That, that option absolutely exists. Your maximum amount available to you, I don't know offhand for some reason. Five million sticking in my head, but I so feel well like over, we've used half of that. So well, well over the settlement right amount. Uh, I think we may be close or pushing it. I, okay. I'll, uh, tomorrow, when I send on the on the borrowing cost, I'll get clarification on what that capacity. Okay. Uh, Mayor, the quick is. follow up on that: if we were to borrow that and found that um, later on next year we had a surplus, could those whatever we issued in borrowing could be paid off early? Yeah, we would. I would probably encourage you to well, whatever debt we borrow that we could pay it off immediately without penalty. Okay, so the the in, long term interest cost may not be significant right. if we were to find we had okay. And so if we were to adopt this, the, where there's other avenues than having to worry about and dip into reserves, we have some other options to to move forward. In. Yes, I tried to highlight what I thought your options were there. Yeah, so current fund balance, new tax revenue, tax revenue, borrow funds, or make reductions, and certainly any combination of those as well. Okay. okay. Uh, Chris wanted to comment. No? Okay. Uh, Councilor Rupsis? Yeah, I guess I'd wonder from the Budget Committee um, if if this, this is a rather, not delicate, but what's making it tricky is we're trying to both settle the Hauser uh, settlement and do PD-1 all in one uh, one year. And I'm wondering what the urgency to do the PD-1 shift is this year um, and, and even putting us in this situation where we have to think of, well, maybe we would borrow funds for reserves or, or whatever. So I'm, I'm just wondering what the, um, the discussion in the Budget Committee was about why PD-1 this year instead of just letting it shift next year. Sure. Members of the committee, Councilman Brown. Yeah. So I guess a couple of points to keep in mind here, and Andy can correct my math if I get off. If we end up in sort of the worst case, for lack of better terms, where we're at 19% valuation, I think the shortfall is about 700,000. And based on the recommendations that are being given here today, you still, after pay, after using a million in FY23 reserves, there's still two, there's still a million four there. So even in the worst case scenario, you're not dipping below minimum reserves. So far, so good? Okay, you're just not putting as much in above the minimum reserve amount, and the difference is about $700,000. We're on track to do better, in theory. And Andy's being conservative as he should, as a good finance director would. So I don't want people to get a sense that this proposal somehow jeopardizes the minimum or puts us in a position we have to borrow. The only thing, as I understand it, is that we will put less above the minimum reserve amount. From my perspective, and I'll let Councilmember Boyette or Councilmember Gillick speak as well, we have this levy cap to move, to do what we eventually have to do, and we should protect it. We should protect it now. I think it immediately frees up the Park District 1 to, to or the Parks Department to get away from the unending debate of what PD-1 can legitimately be used for and just program the department for what the community actually needs. And I think the sooner we do that, the better. And I think the sooner we protect the space in the cap, the better for Parks Department because we'll ultimately have to go here anyhow. So from my perspective, those were the reasons that um, I supported doing this. And I would let Councilmember Boyad or Gulick jump in with their thoughts. Uh, Councilmember Gulick. Yeah, I think that some of the other discussion was uh, in terms of 
potentially going forward to with a bond, um, a parks bond, that it just would be easier to have the whole PD1 piece out of the picture and kind of settled. I think that was the another motivation. Um, you know, that being said, um, it's, that, that's, that was our thinking. Um, there's been other discussions that occurred certainly outside of the, the, the of that uh, committee about parks that I, I'm certainly interested in if there's feedback from, from people who have been thinking a lot about the parks uh, funding, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to. But that, that was our, our thinking. Other members, uh, Councilor Boyette. Uh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this has to go away. It's going to go away. We just thought this was the best time to do it because of the capacity going forward. Um, it's going to have to stop. And trying to explain to the public, well, what are the two different, why do we have PD-1 and now you're asking for more for the parks? This way we only have one topic. If we do, if we do a park bond, it's only for the parks because the operate, this PD-1 is gone. Um, could we wait another year? Sure, but this is the time just to get it over with. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else, Councilor Marupsis, on the way to follow up? Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Councilor Member Pearrington. Thank you. So, at one point, there was something that was said about reductions. What sort of reductions are we looking at? You've got 14, I think, FTEs coming up that's pr it's proposed. I don't know that they would all fit into the category of where, you know, they would be in this department without commingling funds or whatever. But could you tell me what reductions we're looking at? So, uh, no, I, I can't. We don't have, <laughs> I don't have any prepared or recommended reductions. Um, you know, our recommended funding strategy for this is, you know, reserves and, and tax. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, present options that exist to you. Certainly mm -hmm. it is an option. Uh, with respect to the FTEs, I don't know. Uh, there's a couple of court ones, but those are related to the public safety mill levy. Right. And otherwise, there's there's nothing up there that's funded by the general fund. So I, I, don't, I don't know that this is an avenue. That's what I was yeah. wondering. Um, yeah, that, that's not really an avenue for you uh, to realize funding for this. So follow up, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. So Chris, I guess this would be the question to you. If someone were inclined to say, well, let's look at some reductions because there are increases in this budget, um, what areas would we look at in reductions? And I don't know if there's enough on council that would even agree to, well, let's look at reductions also. Councilmember Purrington, Mayor and Council. So, um, I I would want to work with our staff to to make some recommendations to you. The issue, and I want I want to pull Andy into the conversation a little bit because it's definitely affecting this. Can you, can, Andy? Sorry, fair or unfair? I'm trying to remember the last few budgets. We have avoided inflationary adjustments at the level of what was happening with inflation. Um, I want to say this current year's budget was approximately 3%. For, so overall, tax revenue increase was, I think, was 5.7 or 6%. I'm not talking about the proposed budget. I'm talking about the current oh. fiscal year we're in right now. Yeah, the, the current one was 1% from the prior year. On, on average, our tax revenue is like 2.3, 2.5% growth. So that we had to live within that um, because of the 74 mil cap. So the primary reason I go there is because though we've been dealing with the inflation from the pandemic, it was not new this year. It's been a couple fiscal years. We've not, we've not been able to and haven't increased revenue. We've just had to deal with it within. And some areas you're seeing in this proposed budget are double digits, particularly on the insurance side of the equation that we literally don't have control over. Um, property insurance, liability, some of those things. So I just want you to know those pressures, it's not just we said, oh, well, inflation's going to be 6%, so everything can go up 6%. Um, we would need to have discussions, and it would make no sense for those to be in the public safety areas, right, with the public safety levies and with our priorities on safety. 
So then your next general fund component is going to be parks, which each time we've talked about that, there's not been a desired outcome for the reduction of services there. Um, we would, to make meaningful changes long term, it would need to come in a personnel area of somewhere. Okay, uh, just because we got a, a lot ahead of us, we'll uh, try to, uh, Council Member Treaky, and I, I would just seem to say that we've wandered pretty far away from the uh, settlement okay. um, as a topic. And if we do discuss re reductions, I would like to see a significant portion of the council um, asking the staff for reductions. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so number three, council, where are we headed? Uh, I, I'm not seeing clear opposition to the proposal. Good questions, interesting but not clear opposition. So that's again, some thumbs up. So uh, thumbs up, um, press ahead. Um, uh, number four, uh, additional personnel for uh, facilities. This is $85,000 in the facilities tar department for somebody that'd be dedicated uh, for the eight um, uh, police stations, correct, John? Correct, Mayor. Fire stations one through eight, 911 call center, and then the training center at the airport. Anybody want to, uh, Council Member Boyette? Yeah, and I'll try to say it better. If we have, we're, we've added staff for MRU and we've added staff for CRU, hopefully. And that should stop the big red truck from leaving the fire department. So those people are still sitting there, but they're not going out on a call. Right. Could we not use those people, what they're already doing, looking at their own facilities? Yeah, Mayor and Council, certainly. But also the expectation isn't for them to do skilled repairs and maintenance. And that's what this position would do. So they would come in and they would replace an atmospheric boiler or a recirculation pump. I don't think the firemen have the skill set to do that, nor is that within their scope of work. So currently, the, the way that the workflow happens is fire personnel informs BC, BC informs assistant fire chief, then you inform facilities, and then we mobilize vendors. So it's extremely inefficient for us to keep operating that way. Additionally, we want to be intentional about our approach to deferred maintenance and move past this agnostic approach of keeping the lights on and for us to do that we need we need staff and then additionally if we really want to be serious about implementation of septet principles we need to have staff on the facility side dedicated to implementing and then maintaining those principles and then additionally it's extremely expensive for battalion chiefs and assistant chief to be running point on facilities maintenance and repair projects Okay, Council Member uh, Owen, Council Member Nice. I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but this is also one that we didn't really get a chance to consider in the Budget Committee, so I, I do have some concerns about it. I, John, help me understand why we're adding a facilities maintenance person and we need this person as well. <clears throat> this doesn't seem like a full FTE is my ultimate question. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Uh, I think that the best way that I can articulate this is there's been a dearth of preventative maintenance for 20 years. So the way we're operating now is all that we know. In order for us to jump that S curve and actually be proactive instead of reactive, we need these people. However, like for me to say aspirationally, I want to be here, it's difficult for me to actually articulate what that looks like. So on the facility side, we're managing half a million square feet. 42 acres, we're taking on additional square footage with new city hall. We're understaffed for the level of services that I would like to provide. And then additionally on the fire side, I think that there's more than enough work for this position to be full-time, considering all the backlog of work that hasn't been done and additionally all the work that should be done. What would be the consequence if you just got one person this year and one person next year? That is a good question. I'm two for two. You are. <laughs> I lucked out tonight. So I, I think the consequences <laughs> that we could potentially run into is, right, we're just extending that agnostic approach for the fire department. And I, I don't want to necessarily say that that's a good or a bad thing. It just is, right? So then we have to regroup and figure out what's our best approach to that. And is it continuing that workflow of, battalion chief, assistant chief to facilities, and then potentially see those inefficiencies snowballing? Or is it getting that person on staff, spending two to three months to getting them up to speed on how we want to operate and then letting them go and tackle those things? 
Okay. Um, Councilmember Bernice, you had your hand up. Councilmember Gillick. Thank you, Mayor. So you, you explained a little bit about uh, kind of what the process is now. And so I, I'm having trouble with this posi additional position as well because I'm not seeing a position re being reduced in the, in the fire side. And so if you, you kind of said that, well, it's kind of taken up, you know, their whole time. There's like a full-time job there. So why are we not just removing one from the fire and then bringing one over here? And so the net amount is different. Instead, we're going to charge them an extra $85,000 for that. And so what, what do you see? How's the process going to go? You kind of explained it you know, what it is today. How is the process going to go when you have someone in the facility? Yeah, Mayor and Council, so this position would report to facilities, but they'd be dedicated towards fire department projects, repairs and maintenance. And how I envision this position to function is that they're on site all day at those fire stations. So they go out, they do their condition assessments, and they keep a more or less a punch list of work and items that need to be completed, and then they go out and those tack tackle those items. And they're the first one to hopefully triage those issues and repair them before they become an issue of, hey, the sump pump isn't working and the basement is flooded, or hey, the air conditioning is not working and it's 95 degrees in the building. So th the basic idea is that they're running point, they're triaging so that <clears throat> we're not having to handle those repairs after the fact. As far as the staffing level on the fire department side, I can't speak to that. It might be a administration question. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Councilmember Gillick, before you do it, just while we're on that, I apologize. Uh, are we spending money for third-party contractors that would be saved if this position were added on the fire uh, department side? Yes, Mayor, because right now, currently, there, there's no real maintenance staff, fire department personnel mows the lawn, they do snow removal some light landscaping, anything of skilled repair, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, access control, uh, doors, locks, glazing, everything is out tasked. But so this person would be able to do that? What's the net savings? So what's the actual net cost? Th that I don't know. I don't have those numbers in front of me. I I'd have to sit down probably with Andy and look at the fire department budget to see what that O&M budget is each year. And then assuming that we get somebody with that skill set to handle a lot of that work. Okay, but there, that's an element of this, I guess. Councilor Regula? Yes, thank you. I, I think I had a, a similar question initially as, as uh, Council Member uh, Nice did, um, but it, it, what it sounds like is right now there just aren't any fire department FTE dedicated to this. Uh, it's not like we're, I mean, I think, I think it makes sense that the facilities take this on rather than fire department staff who experienced in evaluating buildings, understanding how to put bids out, all that kind of uh, work. Um, so it sounds to me like this is, if in the absence of, of there being an FTE within the fire department that it's displacing, um, it sounds like what we're doing more is an investment now that to avoid future costs for breakdowns of things and or um, an investment now that reduces future utility costs that we were avoided a utility costs. It, would that be safe to say? Yes, Councilmember Gulick, and I think that a lot of the, the value in this position comes from what you just articulated. Right now, a lot of this work is ad hoc for fire department staff, and that's kind of like Kevin Ifland said a couple weeks ago. Chief Johnson has a little construction knowledge, so this is your other duty as assigned, right? And it, it's becoming extremely inefficient and, and I think that's where the value in these positions come from. Okay, uh, Councilmember Broad. Mayor, I apologize, I just have one more question. And I don't know if this is gonna be for you or for Andy, but we have a new maintenance tech for facilities Correct. proposed. And a new facilities person to do, you said eight fire stations, 911 center and, and the training facility, right? Correct. And that person we estimated about $95,000. Or I'm sorry, $85,000. Correct. But then we also have a library facilities person who's estimated $96,000, presumably just for the library footprint. Help me understand how all, <laughs> I thought you might hand yeah. that off, how all these work together. <laughs> the library ones at 96, where'd you get that? Let's start there. 96 of the budget. Okay, I'm sure it's right then. Um, <laughs> does that include I can't imagine the salary costs are just 96 unless there's additional O&M. So Jamie is here. She's the library facilities coordinator. 
I don't know. I yeah. Imagine, right? Yeah. Ninety six seems a bit high. I'll. I will. I. Yeah. I can't imagine it's that high, but I'll. I'll double check that. But just to be clear, we think that library person is a full time FTE to maintain just the library, but the fire department one is going to maintain ten separate facilities. Yes. So the library one, I did. I did get a chance to talk to Gavin, and he sent Jamie. He couldn't be here tonight. Um, but the library position, you know, ideally will fill in gaps for times when there is not currently uh, janitorial staff on, and then in addition to that, come in in off hours and you know prep from clean the building from the day so that in the next morning it's ready to go. Um, and I guess if you want to give more on that, Jamie, she can. But that's about all I got from Gavin, and she certainly will know more. No, on that. So. looks like we're good. So that's okay. So. We'll follow. But we uh, between now and our next uh, meeting, if we can follow up with more information, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Okay, Council, how do you want to proceed? Good questions, uh, uh, John. You, you, you're jumping up. You had something else. I had another question for John. Perfect, Councilor Bernice. John, why is the library facilities position not under facilities? I'll defer to Chris. <laughs> we are still in that transition of going. Remember, what we inherited and what the organization ran in, until just a few years ago was a very decentralized system. So our, de our departments were responsible for their facilities. And so that transition, we're still in the process of making. We do not have... You know, though we've moved John into his position, and before John, um, Jessica. Jessica, thank you. I owe you, Jessica. Um, we've just get into that that transition that we made to create an actual oversight of all facilities. We're still working on that as COVID and hiring and transitions have happened. So ultimately, that is where we want to get to, is where John would be and the staff maintaining facilities wouldn't just be assigned to particular buildings unless there's enough capacity there to do it. We'd benefit from them doing multiple. So this budget cycle, that's not something that you can do where you, instead of hiring two additional facilities, people, kind of like Council Member Owen said, one, one this year, including both the fires and the library, and then a second one next year if you need to, or run over budget if you had to, to come with a budget amendment if you had to get the second one. Yeah, there's some adjustments to our plan that can be made, but that's certainly something that we can't overcome. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Council, we're uh, at 7.30. We want to wrap this up. I guess what I'm interpreting here is a muddled green light but with some yellow uh, trim around it uh, or, 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 a, or a red light even uh, by some. Um, I don't know whether there would be time between now and our next meeting to come up with some sort of a consolidation of these uh, positions or something uh, that would uh, uh, help move this one forward. If it came down to a raw vote, I, I, I don't know how it would stand up. Council, anybody want to bring greater clarity to this uh, item number four? But we should uh, break and move on to number five. Um, we take a break. Well, let's, let's try to wrap this one up in some way, though, uh, number four. Um, so how are we leaving this? Council Member Puritan, Council Member Ripsis? I, I, on For me, I would put more of a red light on this particular item right now. Um, I don't know that there's anything that uh, staff could come back to change this. Um, I think some of the things that came out of, I guess, what I'm hearing from the budget committee, even though it wasn't truly, you know, completely uh, run through that budget committee, I, at this point, I would say no on this one. I don't know if you want to just take a draw of uh, uh, sure. So um, I'm kind of I've got a little no and yes list. Uh, I, I've got the no list with Council Members Boyetto and uh, Neeson Purrington. Um, 
I guess I, I am kind of in the yes because it doesn't make sense for Chris to be in charge of maintaining City Hall and Wyeth to be main, in charge of maintaining uh, the Miller Building any more than it has 10 different people in the fire department. That makes sense. I would like to see the, the consolidation that we were just talking about so that uh, there would be some combination across all that Chris was just talking about. That makes sense. But on this immediate item, I guess I'm okay because the alternative doesn't seem to be very good. And I think we could probably save some money by doing stuff in house rather than using consultant or uh, uh, contractors. But um, how else are, are people coming down? Uh, yes. Council Member Rupsis, you. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I'd, I'd probably agree with you on, on the, this facility's personnel. Um, it seems like this is a bit. Uh, more of a technical skill set than what we're talking about at the library, which sounds more like a janitorial position. I'm not sure if that's really sounded like it was getting cleaned up overnight and those types of things, which is a very different facilities type person than what we're, talk, what we're talking about for the fire department. So as far as consolidation, I don't think you're going to find somebody to do both of those things. But the overall direction of consolidating uh, facilities maintenance makes a lot of sense. Uh, whether we're going to figure that out in the next week and a half, I'm not sure that it's it's there. So I'm probably inclined to support this one. What would be helpful is if, fire, if the fire department was here justifying their, their budget because they're going to be paying for this out of chargebacks. So um, I think if, if there's anything that could help me, you know, with my decision making on that, it would be hearing from the fire department about uh, what they expect savings to be and, and what they expect the, uh, the budget impact to be this year and, and, and ongoing. Councilmember Tidswell did a thumbs down, so I've added him to that list. Councilmember Treaky. Uh, thumbs up. I mean, it, this is one of those positions where at this point it's going to be hurting cats. You're not going to be able to pull any order together in the fire department and taking care of the facilities until you have somebody responsible for doing it. So whatever else may be going on in any of the other ones, we need to do this at the fire department. Councilmember Gulick. Yeah, I, I, enthusiastic uh, thumbs up for having that uh, personnel. I think we really need it. I, I would go back to the fire department and see if we can get that out of their budget, though, because I, I think um, that's we're serving the interests of the, of, of the future budgets of, of the fire department in terms of deferred maintenance, addressing that in terms of um, reduced utilities that they pay. I think that's where we should try to get it. Okay, Councilmember Member Troy. So uh, this is now up to Council Member Shaw, since uh, so let's send her the email. It's it's her choice, really, because of course it's five five. So I think that's about the best we're going to do on this item for now. So um, uh, we'll take a. a it's uh, seven thirty six. Let's come back as soon as we can, and we'll move on to uh, number five.
Okay, looks like we are all uh, uh, back together. And so um, uh, we left off with item number five, the increased funding for elections. So $120,000 for a possible second election. Uh, and that includes um, uh, 105 for the election plus roughly 15, I guess would be the, or no, I'm sorry, an additional 125,000. So the anticipate is 105 for election, but that then includes 20 for possible public education on a parks uh, uh, bond issue request. Um, uh, council, how do you want to proceed? Uh, are we good with this one? And, and of course, we will be able to change course on this potentially because we'll know about whether there's going to be a primary or not before the budget is actually approved. Councilmember Owen. Yeah, Mayor, that was going to be my suggestion, is that we try to just sort of tentatively hold on this one, particularly because these funds, as identified here, could offset close to a third of the increased planning costs that are proposed. So I would suggest that we, you know, be a little bit patient and see how this plays out. Um, and if we have the opportunity to not levy the full amount that is being proposed for planning and use these funds instead, I think that's a wise use of dollars. Okay, thank you. Andy, can you just comment on how this impacts your drafting? <laughs> You know, going forward, do you need a default, what, something to stick in here or not? Or, um, it's a good question. Lots of them tonight. Um, the, <laughs> right now, the draft has 120 in it for one one election. I I think 105 is the high end, honestly, from uh, historically what we've been billed. Um, if we share the election with other governmental entities it gets some of those costs get split so you know we we probably I don't know we may come back with a budget amendment if there's a primary and it's not included that that would be my recommended resolution of this okay and so what about the parks com if we didn't include the second election component amended, would you one. recommend dialing this down to another quite a bit smaller number if we did not Include it for the primary, is that what you said? Yeah, is that what yeah. you were suggesting for the time being? Yeah, I think the recommendation from Chris and I would be that even if we don't have a primary, some funds be added, obviously, at a significantly lower rate. So funding is available for marketing, probably 15 grand uh, in education. Okay. Um, is 15 sufficient? And if so, Council, what do you think about just putting in 15, but then being prepared to increase in, if there is a primary? Good? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that we got. Okay. So that's the, the plan uh, on that one. Um, and then uh, number six, the uh, municipal court uh, analysis, uh, the proposed uh, $210,000 to, to come out of reserves. Um, again, I think this is one that's probably we're on track with. Um, we were hoping for a smaller cost, but uh, my understanding is that's the number that we've been given. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on the cost. Um, Chris? I would say, Mayor, Mayor and Council, we did actually. So this is off of two bids. So we did do an RFP process. We were very grateful. Frankly, anticipated getting one proposal. We got two proposals, and so we are working off of an actual proposal. We are negotiating the scope of work. Uh, we had a Zoom call on that last week. So we we are very confident we'll be at 210 or under 210 because we were on the phone with our building architects making sure we weren't duplicating work for what John and his crews are already doing at the new city hall. So this is a good number, it or less. Okay. All right. So um, uh, move ahead on number six. Okay. Uh, then uh, uh, number seven, uh, the SEPTED implementation. Um, I was commenting to Council Member Owen, this is, uh, so the proposal is $120,000 come from uh, uh, mental health, substance abuse, crime prevention dollars, whatever we want to call those, uh, to be used for implementation of SEPTED recommendations. Um, uh, personally, I have no problem with that as a, as a, as a goal. Um, my concern is that these are, there's about four items that are relying on substance abuse, mental health, marijuana dollars, and um, uh, we uh, we haven't included other things that could potentially be paid for out of those items. For example, 
um, mental health uh, impacts um, from marijuana. Um, the jail study that we were offering to to provide or work with the um, uh, county commissioners, uh, we could still end up going down that path in some way, and that's not part of uh, this. Uh, uh, the full season uh, continuum of care um, uh, 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 what sort of uh, shelter <laughs> are they going to come back and, and ask for a full season on that substance abuse connect are they going to come back is our crew plan going to crew program going to expand in the future all of these I think are good ideas but they're all coming from that same source and I for one would like to see a better written explanation of this is the money we're going to expect this is the money we've already committed um, these are the options I would call it a budget within a budget for these dollars so if it were up to me we would allocate one chunk but then come back after uh, June 30th and actually dig down to figure out how we're going to allocate those dollars um, those are my Comments, obviously, Councilmember uh, Tidswell, Councilmember Purington. <clears throat> Have we seen any analysis or data about crime on city-owned properties? Cumulative averages. Yep. So, um, really exciting. Uh, exciting. That's the wrong word. Because we wish you didn't have heat maps that showed crime problems, particularly our one of our roughest areas is North Park. Of our public spaces, North Park is uh, as our septet attendee from New Jersey <laughs> said, who grew up in Philadelphia, you don't want to lose these spaces. Once you lose them, you'll spend years and exponentially more dollars and time to get them back. So uh, new director Pig and I met with uh, Wes, um, Wes, I'm sorry, uh, Lieutenant Wes, uh, our crime prevention, who was at the SEPTED training, they're very excited about what can and needs to be done with lighting and implementation of SEPTED principles to that they believe, according to the data nationally, can have an absolute, potentially double-digit drop or assistance in lowering crime in some of our public spaces, particularly a park like North Park, a park like South Park. Uh, and others. I just don't want to say those are the only two, but that's where we want to get started. They're very excited about having some dollars. We don't need to spend these dollars doing the septet analysis. Those have been done. Uh, a rough one has been done. We have the resources internally to do that. It's actually to do some improvements to these spaces. Councilor yeah, uh, be There are many facilities that we could be that could be analyzed for improvements. Are we more? Are we going to look at that full range, or, or are we going to target like you're talking about? Well, I we have uh, we had had just that first meeting uh, with the uh, sergeant last week. We've got all those who went to the training scheduled for a lunch next week as to how do we best roll out what we learned across our properties park properties and our other municipal properties. And I think some of that will come through uh, possibly an administrative order of which would be within my purview as far as how we treat things administratively. Some of it will be working to get voluntary compliance out of our community. And frankly, some of it's going to come to you because a whole lot of the training is what cities, states, and some countries have done to mandate SEPTED analyses and implementation in development standards. So all of those things uh, are, are potential moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Perrington, Councilor Nice, Councilor Dre. So a couple of issues with um, this, this right here is that, you know, Chris, you just said that it's within your administrative purview to do some of this. But yet whenever we are allocating funds for SEPTED and you know, people are going to training, and it's it's like, oh, we've got this wonderful idea. But I think, first and foremost, that council needs to hear what you're learning, what you're doing, what the plan is, how to use SEPTED. And you just made the comment that I wasn't going to go there, but you brought it up. Oh, they're saying, oh, now with cities and states and even countries are saying we're going to Im implement this into development. Right there, that's taken away. That's that is implying to me that government is going to start inserting itself into property rights, and so 
if the city wants to do it on our city owned properties, that's one thing, but I think we need to find out a little bit more about what SEPTED actually can save us on, what it can actually do. And of course, there's no actuality in anything because, you know, life happens. But even to put money aside for SEPTED, because as I said, I think at our last meeting, we haven't adopted SEPTED principles. I don't know that we want to or have a policy concerning SEP 10, and if we do, it's just on city-owned property. So that's my thing about all of this is that I, I, I'm not ready for that because I don't have enough information on what SEP 10 even does. I do know that Dan Brooks sent us an email. I haven't had a chance to read it. I'm not sure what his suggestion was, but uh, I think we need to look at it a little bit closer before we start allocating more money for it. Uh, okay, uh, Council Member Nees, Council Member Dre. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to look at that email. I had not seen it yet myself. Um, on this, I'm I'm very supportive of SEPTED principles, and I think that uh, I think the city does need to do um, do a lot of work in SEPTED. But my my concern about the hundred twenty thousand is, it's not. It's not within each department. It's not coming from the departments. It's kind of like you said, Chris, and this is actually the first I heard about it. It's, it's an administrative, it's, it's basically 100, it's, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. We're, we're providing you $120,000 to spend, as you will, out of the uh, substance abuse and safety funds on SEPTED um, improvements to city facilities. And that's correct. Okay, and so I, I am concerned that it's not driven with the plan of the departments have said, hey, you know, we need to increase our budget by fifty thousand this year because we have some SEPTED principles. We have to, you know, the Parks Department says this is what we have to do, and you know, the Fire Department says this is what we have to do for SEPTED for their facilities. And so I'm a little concerned that we're just throwing the, into this pot, and it's and it's really more. Um, not really to me it's not closely related enough to substance abuse and and um and, and public safety in that respect i mean there's some public safety there but i'm i'm not so sure that it, if it were taken out of that two mills i don't think it fits in my view as what i print, viewed as that two mills to be used on although I, again i think sept is important and i think if there's funds out of the general fund that we can use great but i'm not 100 percent sure coming out of that uh, Council Member Troy and then Council Member Gielek. Uh Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, the Mayor suggested um, kind of looking at this not individually but as a, a pot where we kind of compare and contrast what we could get out of it. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, not that any one of these is a bad idea. Most of these have come forward from Council initiatives. So SEPTED um, domestic violence, family. Um, there, that's not a bad idea for council to, to help direct where they feel those dollars has, have been or should be spent. Not a bad idea at all. But I think that some of the um, that we could better make better decisions based on all of the different possibilities for our funding. And then we would handed two more things, continuum of care and Head Start. So then again, we're kind of getting new information. Um, and we also, and then we have these. So I like the idea that we could actually look at them as a, as a, as a whole and decide where our dollars should be best spent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Rekulik. Um, you know, I do is actually support the SEPTED implementation um, in terms of, I mean, it's appropriate that it be coming out of crime prevention uh, pot of money. I, I guess I, I do feel like, yeah, there's there's work to be done to educate the council to, to bring us up to speed uh, on on a lot of the great things that have been learned uh, the the staff had, had done. Uh, valuations of all these different facilities. I think it makes sense um, maybe to take an approach for the budget purposes uh, as the mayor is, is advocating that's more general. Uh, it, I don't want to kick the can too far down the road, <laughs> though, I guess, the, but but I, I, 
I think SEPTED probably should be part of, of that crime prevention stuff, but, but I don't want to hold up things in our budget um, process because we don't have enough education of, of our members uh, of the council yet. So uh, I, think I, I think the mayor has probably got a good approach. Um, other comments on I, uh, this side? Council Member uh, says Council Member Treaky. And Thank you, Councilmember Owen. I'm going to probably agree with uh, Councilmember Nice here. Um, I think it's important and we should be doing it. I'm probably more likely to support it coming out of those excess funds or excess reserve funds for this year uh, to get that program started. Hopefully you can pr put some uh, fairly good um, kind of guardrails on, on how those projects are evaluated and brought forward and evaluated and, uh, and, and ultimately approved. I don't know that we need to be involved in, in approving every one of them, but some education on how, how you put that program together and, and manage that uh, to me. Uh, fits nicely and unless we get into the point where using those excess reserves it does affect Andy's mental health here and then we can start talking about putting them back into the other fund uh, but until then probably just the general fund reserves thank you council member uh, tricky council member Owen thank you mr. mayor I do not support taking this money out of the mental health and substance abuse fund um, I did not like the idea of doing the shelter last year because I don't think it had directly impacted a real cause of any of the problems that we're doing here. Lack of lighting, lack of being able to see into a space definitely has a specific incident kind of influence, but it's not an underlying root cause of the problem. So I, I, can't, I can support the idea of it coming from somewhere else in the budget, but, but not from this line item. Uh, Councilor Rowan. Thank you, Mayor. I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. I think we've seen some great parks projects come out of CDBG funds. I think we have an opportunity to do that again in the year coming up, assuming that, that they're in you know, qualifying areas. Um, but I want to speak to this idea of sort of punting on all of these amendments. And I just want to offer a, a little word of caution. Um, last year, when we were working on the budget, we had a debate about whether or not we even levied the two mil because we didn't have a plan and we didn't have a strategy. And here we sit on the eve of another budget saying, well, we can't make any decisions because we don't have a plan and we don't have a strategy. We are potentially proposing to ask the voters for $130 million in parks capital investment. And if our number one priority is the safety of this community, three stabbings over the weekend, just one weekend, three stabbings, then I would suggest that this budget send a strong message that we are going to be serious about directing resources towards public safety. Some of these things are prevention, and so they're longer lead times. Some of them are more urgent, and um, they, you're right, they have not been vetted and discussed in details, but each of these budget priorities, all of which could be changed if something did not pan out, sends a clear signal to this community that we will not wait any longer to take decisive action to make our community safer. So while it may be appealing to wait for some future date, we have been saying that now for a full year, that we will wait for some future work session where we maybe someday make some decisions. And I'm not suggesting that these are right. Certainly I like them and I support them. But I would just suggest that in context, this budget should tell the community very clearly public safety is our number one priority. And we should do that with more specificity than we've done in the last year. Thank you, Council Member Nice. Mayor, I think we should move forward with this, this amendment, but I don't think it should be coming out of mental health. And so, I, and, and the other thing it should do is it should, and I don't mind it being under the city administrator's purview as long as it says we need, you know, of the 120,000, how we're going to spend it. 75,000, it goes over into the parks because this is what we have identified as doing or you know, 30,000 is going to go into whatever. So we have some idea of what, where this money is going. And so there's a, there's a plan for that. So if, if you came up with 120, there must be a, a plan of that. And so if this amendment could come back to us um, using different funds and a little bit more details, I think this, this is something that we should could, and should move forward. It, and uh, do you want to suggest the source of funds? Would those be marijuana dollars or would those be reserves or? I think the staff is going to best know where the source of funds. It could be reserves. It could be marijuana funds. I think marijuana funds are going to be much more closely related than than uh, the substance abuse and mental health. I think Council Member Owen also mentioned CBDG funds. So there's, I think there's a lot of different funds that may be able to be looked at. Okay, uh, I see a thumbs up on that. Um, 
uh, for my comments, I make a big distinction in my mind between relatively modest one-time ch uh, charges to these any of these funds versus things that are likely to become permanent. I get real nervous about uh, several of the later items that once we go down that path, I'm not quite sure how we would stop going down those paths. But this is a falls in that kind of that one-time um, uh, hit, I guess. Chris, the hundred twenty thousand dollars, where'd that come from? Is I, it purely just? I don't want to say. A, Pulled out of thin air because that's derogatory, but it's sure not, not completely thin air. But what, as we had the conversation on Thursday with with the sergeant, I, I did throw this number out. He was excited about the seventy five that was in the current fiscal year, and now after the SEBTED training, was like, "Hey, I know we can get after making some upgrades in North Park alone." Uh, so I asked him. Part of our moving forward is less match up crime mapping with public spaces and see how many parks or spaces w which make sense to start getting after with this dollar amount. If we don't need it all, we'd present it that way. If we needed 180,000, I'd be back showing you guys the reason why they're saying 180 would be wise to be putting into these spaces in these ways. So I take a little bit different approach than Councilmember Nieces. I think you've got the dollar amount but said, Chris, you need to bring back what the plan is to where to spend these in the public spaces, backed up with the police department in the parks police officer as to where it makes the most sense to invest it. That's what we can bring to you and not spend any of the actual dollars until you see what we're doing at this particular park or space and why we picked that over something else. But it does send a very clear message, like last year, there are real dollars in the adopted budget to get it implementing wherever you want it to come from, whether you want it crime prevention or someplace else. And I'm falling prey to what the mayor has reminded me throughout this, which is I wish, in hindsight, this was about crime prevention dollars. That's what we kept saying in the community. But we've so said mental health and substance abuse where I think it really is about crime prevention, period. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Ripsis? Just real quick, I think we should be also be including the, not just public spaces and parks, but like public rights away. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yep. Just So that's in there too. I mean, it might be the area around a park that we can do some things in the right away that, that help it as well. Okay. Uh, Council, how do we want to proceed with this item? Are we moving forward with something SEPTED related? Um, general show of, let's do it this way. General show of hand, move forward with something SEPTED related, then we'll come back about the funding source, which was Council Member Nice's issue. So uh, how many people are generally supportive of moving forward with a SEPTED uh, uh, expenditure? Um, uh, that's a clear majority. Uh, how about on the funding source, you've heard the suggestion of something other than uh, mental health and substance abuse, public safety, mill levy dollars. Um, uh, how many are in favor of that? Council Member Nee, so on. Uh, okay, there seems to be a majority of that too. So I, I guess that's the direction of council right now. Are we good on six or good enough? Okay, um, and uh, then number, s uh, I'm sorry, that was number seven. I, uh, uh, that was number seven. And uh, number eight, uh, domestic violence uh, funds, uh, Family Justice Center, $200,000. Um, that's also mental health, public safety funds. Um, other comments, questions, direction on this item? Uh, for me, this falls in that uh, uh, concern I have before that uh, we've, we've heard about it, but again, there's no plan. And I would assume, correct me if I'm wrong, we're really not talking about one-time capital dollars. We're talking about mm, O&M and capital. Councilmember Member Owen? Uh, well, I'm not sure that I'm equipped to answer that question. I just, maybe I'll share my perspective. This is a staff amendment. Um, I was not expecting this to show up, but um, I'm not certainly not opposed to it because I do think with half of the assaults in the community last year being um, family violence related, we should take family violence issues much more seriously. And one of those options is a family justice center. Now that said, the establishment of family justice center, whether we're investing in the capital or the ongoing O&M, is a heavy, heavy lift. And I don't think council's there yet. 
So I like the way that this amendment has pivoted to say, we're going to do something for domestic violence. It's consistent with what we did last year for domestic violence in, in terms of the amount. Um, and that maybe that thing will be a family justice center. There is a contract for technical assistance that will begin this summer um, to help us understand this better. So I think we shouldn't assume that this will be an FJC, but rather a prioritization of resources for domestic violence based out of what we see from this technical assistance contract, because I think council needs to know more about an FJC, where it would be, what our participation would be in it, other sources of funding. There's a lot of work to do here, but I like the idea of beginning to set aside funds to do something significant on one of the largest categories of unaddressed crime in this community. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Boyette. I see this as an analysis of the feasibility of a center for 200000 That's all it says. So this is a one-time process, not a continuing process. No, I apologize if I misstated. We've already funded the analysis. Th that's done. This, is, this amendment is, is not to do that. It's to begin to set aside, costs, set aside funds to act on those recommendations. That's not what this says, though. Go ahead. It's a, it's a staff amendment, so Chris can respond. Well, the the intent is what uh, Council Owen is saying is so you you have a we have a Vista volunteer and we have a contract through that with the agency that goes around the country analyzing services related to this that that assessment I'm assuming is going to come with it with a set of recommendations and education for all of us I've never been through one either mm -hmm. and rather than and, and the intent is to have some dollars at whether we go. FJC route or some other components of the recommendations we're not waiting another eight or ten months or six months to have some fiscal capability to implement something um, so if the wording is wrong we can adjust the wording uh, do for you see this as a every year 200,000 or a one-time 200,000 I, I actually I, I think you're every year at least doesn't have to be just from this, but as Councilmember Owen said, if half of our uh, aggravated assaults in Billings, Montana are related to fi family violence, truth is we're spending tens of millions of dollars in our budget every year dealing with the consequences of this bad behavior. When do we start trying to get in front of it? And that's the commitment we made through the public safety levy was two mills out of 32 mills is going to be on the prevention side. Uh, other comments, Councilmember Bernice, Councilmember Treaky. Thank you, Mayor. So, as I understand, we're we're gonna we're gonna put the we're basically this is gonna be a kind of savings account to put two hundred thousand dollars aside, so that after this study comes back to us, that is, I'm assuming is gonna be presented back to Council sometime in the fall. Whenever it's completed, absolutely. Then we'll make some decisions at that time to say we're going to move forward or let's say we're not going to move forward, then that $200,000 is just over budget and we don't. But otherwise, we may have to come back and say, hey, we're going to have to spend not just 200000 but a $1 million, and this 200000 is just the start process of it. Does that kind of summarize? Yes, and Councilman Renice, Mayor Cole, and I, and I apologize. I think I think it's good that, as it says there, domestic violence slash family justice center. It, it, it doesn't have to be exclusively family justice. There's an absolute connection between the two. But yeah, let's assume the council out of the analysis. No, we're not going the family justice center out. You're certainly not going to go the. We're not going to deal with domestic violence or family violence. So you'll have two hundred thousand dollars to put towards specific programs or components that I fully anticipate, though I've not been through it before, the analysis is going to show us where we have deficiencies in Billings, Montana, in our systems relative to trying to reduce this problem in our community. In all due respect, I suspect it's well over 200, but 200 at least, that's why I'd advocated mil, two mills last year, and I'll advocate two mills again. I know it makes us a little bit nervous, but we, we have a problem that's costing us millions of dollars, tens of millions, not hundreds of thousands. Uh, okay, uh, Councilor Treaky. You, you were, I'm sorry. You, you just, have, oh. just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, Chris, I know you've thrown this out, tens of millions of dollars. Can you be more specific, and, and you don't have to do this now, but as far as by the investment of this 200000 or 600 or 800 whatever it may be, how it's going to save us these tens of millions of dollars that you're talking about? 
and you, again, you don't have to do it now, but it, if you could get a little more detail on that in the future, thanks. Thank you, we can do that. I'm not suggesting it's gonna save us tens of millions. I'm just saying we're spending tens of millions year over year over year on our police department judicial system just at the city. Thanks. Councilor Tricky? Yeah, I was just gonna say that I have no idea what's gonna come out of this study, but I'm sure there will be some very good recommendations, and I think it's a very good idea to be in a position to take, adv take advantage of those recommendations as soon as we get them. So I'm 100% behind this. Thank you. Uh, other, other comments? Uh, just to be more specific, Council, my proposal would be that we take these uh, items eight, $200,000, item nine, nurse family partnerships for $200,000, and the item 11, $500,000, all of which would be more or less permanent commitments in my book, and just put them in a pot and then uh, come back to it when we have a better plan. Um, the, so the money, we're not putting the money somewhere else, we're just earmarking in this pot, but not uh, specifically making these allocations, but that's just uh, me talking. Um, other uh, comments before we go to some sort of uh, kind of, I guess, it's, um, a, a vote on number eight. Councilmember Ron. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only thing that I would I would push back on is is I don't. I mean, council will do what it wants, but I don't perceive any of these as permanent funding commitments. Um, we're going to kind of make some decisions about what we want to do on tackling domestic violence at some point during this fiscal year, and we'll decide then how long we're going to commit to funding. I absolutely would not support um, number nine if I thought it were anything more than a two to three year commitment, and the same is true for number 11, and when I get a chance, hopefully I see the clock ticking, and I don't want poor council member Gulick to have to speak at 10 o'clock tonight, but I hope that I will be given an opportunity to speak to number 11 before decisions are made to kick it aside. Sure. Uh, anything else on eight uh, before we have some sort of a show of hands, I guess? Is that how we should proceed? Okay, so the idea is uh, proceeding with number eight uh, or not, right, as, as drafted in those two, two sentences in description. Um, so we'll just say who, who's on board, give me a thumbs up, and then I'll say who's thumbs down. Thumbs up. Council members uh, uh, Gulick, Owen, Joy, Chariki, Purrington, uh, Ripsis, that's uh, six, and sort of thumbs down, or Epstein, I guess you got that option too. Um, you heard my proposal, so I'm the only one in that category, except for Council River Boyette, sort of. And, and we've, got a, we've, we've, we've got a yellow. <laughs> okay, well, there's a majority to, uh, 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 that was green, I guess, on that. Council Member Purrington? Well, I, I kind of like what you said, and I kind of liked what Jennifer's saying, mm -hmm. is that we've got this pot. We haven't come up with what we exactly what we want to spend it on, and I personally don't think we can spend it on all of this, and I don't see it as an ongoing permanent funding. So until we come up with what we're going to do, I'm really having a hard time supporting these just because it's an I don't know. Right. Uh, you know, just to say, well, we're going to have this money and we can spend it however, and, you know, then we're going to have four nonprofits that come before us and say, we're going to do this, this, and this, and then we've got another new process. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, I, I, I will just move on. Uh, so that was eight. Uh, nine is uh, nurse family... Uh, partnerships, um, additional uh, comments, motions, suggestions, Council Member um, Boyette. Um, I think it was last year John Felton came to us from uh, Riverstone and said, I want $100,000 a year for five years for a nurse family partnership, and we're going uh, we're gonna to achieve the goal of 25 families out of 120,000 people. I thought that was crazy at that time, so I voted against it. I didn't want that. To me, uh, $200,000, I mean, I thought my goal as the city councilman was to fix roads, bridges, fix things. I can't fix families, especially of a one- and two-year-old person, even though I think it's a, it's a good program, don't get me wrong. But I think that's $200,000 for a limited number of people that we're actually helping. For $200,000, I'd rather do uh, mental health or substance abuse for the, I, I think, we really need it, or crime prevention, a jail, anything. Just my two cents. 
Okay, uh, 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 Council Members uh, Gulick, Joy, uh, Ripsis. I, I think the intent with this, I mean, based on the extensive research that had been done, is that um, it's like you don't. We could care less about the families or immorality or anything. It's it's a purely a dollar thing that 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 this is the better place to put our money than in policing and detention centers and, and whatnot. That that's what what I think the um, uh, uh, research would, would suggest. Um, uh, the challenge, of course, is that it's a it's a long it's, just, it's a long game that you're playing, um, and us could not single handedly help turn around, but we can be a part of of that. You know, I, I, I'm certainly supportive of, of providing some uh, funding towards that because uh, I think I think there is a compelling crime prevention argument to be made uh, with that, and that that this is. We're looking out not just for the self-interests of 25 families. We're looking out the self-interests of all the taxpayers in terms of, for the long term. Thank you, Councilmember uh, uh, Joy Repsis and Nice. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so, uh, County uh, Prosecutor Twido stood, and I asked a question about women and children, and she said. Um, a very high percentage of the women in passages have never had a job. And you ask yourself, um, how is that? Well, because they don't need a job, because they're involved in illegal activities that aren't called a job, but they're involved with illegal things. Um, one of the, as part of the presentation about this program, one of the very best benefits of it is that the women who are part of this program have jobs. If you don't have a job and you have children and you end up in our court system or our prison system, what happens to those kids? Um, rights are terminated. We have foster kids. At 18, foster kids get, get kicked out. Women who don't have jobs have money. It's not legal. And they're exposing the children that are part of that family to things that are really, really bad. This program helps women get jobs. That means they're part of our legal economy. They are a part of our community where they can contribute positively. And that impact on their children is very, very important. Now, it is that it is very small children that you're actually helping. But we do know the first two years are critical. Attachment disorders will mean that children will never be able to, as adults, and then later in life they can do all kinds of different uh, behavioral changes, but they will never really be able to attach to any person like they should have attached to that person taking care of them. And that doesn't sound like anything really important, except guess what happens if you have a relationship? It ends in divorce. It has a lifelong impact on the stability and the fabric of your community if you have people who cannot um, feel love and give love. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Repsis, Council Member Nice. Yeah, I, I'm all bought into the actual potential benefits of this program. Um, I don't understand the budget impact statement saying we're going to increase our fund by 200000 and it's going to be funded by 300000 in reserves. Estimated fund balance and an additional 100,000 in reserves. I, I don't understand the math there. The other thing I don't understand is what's our exit game if we if we only want to do two to three years. I that doesn't seem to me to be long enough to have the impact that we need to uh, be having here. So so what's the end game? So maybe Andy first. Again. Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle the impact end game here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, the budget side is, uh, it is admittedly a little confusing, and I apologize for that. The 300,000 is FY23 reserves. The 98,966 is a combination of, well, it, it is the, the total estimated revenue in FY24 compared to the estimated expenses in your proposed budget today. With the full two mills that I had not had in there originally, takes that up to net income of about 98000 in FY24. 
So if you, if you looked at, I'll send more clarification tomorrow, but, <laughs> but there is, there's 98,000 more in revenue than there is in expenses in the present budget. That's what that's from. Okay. Uh, is there anything follow up? Then? In terms of the end game. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Please. Okay. okay. Um, so I'll try to answer this as directly as possible. When we look at, and I talked about this a little bit during our retreat, when we look at strategies that work for crime prevention, home visiting works. It is, there are many home visiting programs. There are home visiting programs that operate in our community and they operate just fine. Parents as teachers, Head Start home visiting, early Head Start. So what we need here, the value of this program, it doesn't have to reach everybody. It only has to reach those who are most targeted at having risk factors like likelihood for domestic violence and juvenile crime. In communities that have chosen to use this as a, as a crime prevention strategy, many of those communities, whether it's state or, or cities, have pursued some type of Medicaid funding. Either it becomes billable because they include case management, which is billable, or they ask for a community waiver as a pilot. In either case, by us investing these funds for a year or two, two or three years, to show that this program has a real benefit, a crime prevention, a, a actual measurable benefit, which we have, by the way. We've done this for 12 years. We know 66% reduction in domestic violence, reductions in juvenile crime, which County Attorney Twito will tell you juvenile crime is going through the roof. I think we lay the groundwork for making those cases for ongoing Medicaid eligibility with the state of Montana. So I think that this short-term investment gives us the data we need to advocate for a more comprehensive funding strategy. And again, I just want, I, I think there are other partners who come on board who are doing home visiting already. So I really don't want this point to get lost that yes, it's a small program, but it only needs to be a small program because it's only targeting the highest risk families. We have other privately funded home visiting programs that are working and doing the, the broader prevention work as well. This, this program is distinct in its crime prevention network nexus and its demonstrated ability in other communities to compete for some of those Medicaid waiver strategies when they have the data to show that it works. Uh, uh, okay, Councilmember uh, uh, Councilmember Rupsis, uh, that was yours. Did you have anything follow up? You're good? Okay, so Councilmember Puritan? Just as a follow up to that, and what Councilor happens when the feds don't allocate Medicaid because state Medicaid comes from the, from the feds and then even within the state if they don't allocate it for this particular thing. Yeah, you've run right to the end of my Medicaid skill set, so I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, but I think we have to try something. And this is, this is a thing that the staff are proposing that we try. Um, I think there's a clear nexus to the types of crime we're facing in the community and the types of prevention work we need. So I would say for two or three years, this is worth trying. And I'd cost off Councilmember Reese's name before he'd ask his question. So, Councilmember Reese. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Chris, just to be clear, because that's the, the budget impact says the public safety funds, but this is coming out of the two mills, the two public, the mental health and substance abuse mills that we raised. Yes. Okay. I would I'd appreciate if the amendment would say that so that we can keep track, help to keep track of those, those mills, because that's, that's what we're using it for. And I think this directly correlates to to the mental health. I mean, that's the whole idea of this this um, this program is to, to to get into the home, affect these children, so it avoids these ACEs scores, keeps them low to help their mental health as they grow into adults to be better people in the society. So, I'm all for this program, and I think we should. If if it's you're right, Mayor, this could be a a longer term solution uh, as far as right now it's one two three years i would not mind this going into you know four or five years um and seeing this impact our community for a much longer period of time because it these kids are going to grow up and it's going to take them some time to get into the system for us to see the impact on our community okay thank you other comments uh, councilmember boy councilmember tricky thank you mayor if this is approved it doesn't say how long this is actually going to run. I mean, this is a one-year commitment right now. 
question? Yeah, yes, Councilmember Boya, we'll need to come back to you with an interlocal agreement or contract between ourselves and Riverstone for the time period. And, and if I could, my answer to Councilmember Purinton's question, which I think is an excellent one, is there, the best case scenario is something as Councilmember Owen describes. Worst case scenario is the feds or the state don't take care of our problems for us, and we have to go to our community as a health department not as a city and say this is a program worth investing in and we're going to where do we come up with the local dollars to pay for something that's going to make a difference in our community i think we have to assume that worst case scenario could happen but the evidence is there locally and nationally that it would be a very wise investment so doubling down on the program right now to get more data to prove that to the community the state and the feds think is a wise investment the timeline will need to come in that agreement partnership with them okay uh customer tricky um thank you mr mayor yeah there's literally decades of data on 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 this type of a program and it does work but it is slow going that is absolutely true and and frankly i you know i it would scare me to think about where we are at right now without these programs that are currently in place. Um, in terms of the long game for it, I think this is a very sexy kind of project that we could get the community involved in. Just like, you know, we, we raise money for a whole bunch of other different problems and stuff like that. I think the city with Riverstone could step up and say, hey, Let's start raising some money for this. And um, and I, I forget what the number was where they wanted to be to be fully funded, but I bet we could be fully funded from community sources within a few years. Okay, Council, I'm hearing a majority in favor of this, um, uh, and we need to move on. But uh, uh, just to, so there's no question about that, if you're generally in favor of a green light on number nine, uh, give me a thumbs up. Um, yeah, uh, that's a clear majority in favor of number nine. <laughs> Councilmember Boyette and I are less uh, less enthusiastic. One thing I would ask is because as we move forward making these allocations, I'm not. It's so confusing to me. How much do we have, and how much are, have we spent? <laughs> and, and what's that going to look like this year, next year, the year after that, year after that? And I think that's going to be really important for staff to have. A, a pretty picture that explains uh, what these uh, commitments might look like. Um, okay, so uh, uh, that if that wraps up number nine, okay, so number 10 is the uh, elimination of Park District 1 um, and uh, substituting general fund dollars uh, to the tune of uh, $3.8 million and change um, uh, this coming fiscal year 24. Uh, questions, comments, just a thumbs up, thumbs down. How do you want to proceed? Do we have any? I, I see some thumbs up. Uh, I see five thumbs up. I see one thumbs down. Uh, six. I, I I see two thumbs down, and everybody else with a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, Councilmember Pearson, comment though. Well, just a quick question, and I didn't go back to the budget book, Andy. So whenever we're saying it's a transfer out, is this a neutral exchange for what was last year or what it would have been this year? So is there an increase in that 3.8 from last year? So, yes, the FY23 budget, Park District 1 was 3.8 six and change um, and the recommended budget or the proposed budget right now is 3.823 um, so there's an increase from 23 to 24 yes uh, but that's all for park district one related expenses okay. thank you okay further comment on this item council member joy uh, thank you mayor and council um, I appreciate um, Councilmember Owen's statements about sending a clear message about making public safety very important. Um, I waited two years on council to, for them to get to the point where they were willing to talk about a public safety mill levy increase. I get that. Um, absolutely. I, I don't, 
I, I think that a better thing for us to do is to not take on both the settlement and this move from Parks District 1 into the general fund. Uh, the mayor and I remember very clearly when we were trying to do the opposite, which was to, <laughs> we've gone back and forth with Parks District 1 and where, where it goes. And so, I mean, it's been an evolving thing to, to deal with Parks District 1. I don't think that as many budgets and discussions that I've heard on council that there, there has ever been a really contentious thing about what it pays for. Uh, we very clearly researched that and had many discussions about what it could pay for. I don't think that there's really any contentious issues around that. I think um, taking that one more year and not trying to borrow, I would, I'm very uncomfortable with the thought that we would borrow in order to um, deal with any cash flow issues and even though the estimate is at 19 percent in terms of taxable value um, increase in taxable value and I'm um, very confident in Director Zeller's uh, um, conservative estimate it doesn't give us any cushion and I know that um, I'm going to think back to some things that happened where um, we were very, we've been very fortunate in that that federal funding that has come through to us, it helped us out in some very difficult points, at some very difficult points. I would say in particular when we found out we needed to have uh, changes for our 911 calls, uh, call center and we didn't have any money, and that could not have come from our reserves. So we've benefited from a lot of federal funding that has flown, put, been put into our budget, and it smoothed out some really big bumps. But I don't know that, I really don't feel that it's a good stewardship to run it so close that if we do have some really big bumps, it's not there. And so I, I, I'm not uh, comfortable with uh, borrowing money to go, get over those bumps. And I don't think that both of these need to be done at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Baripsis. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Andy, it, no matter what we do now, we're going to have to set an assessment or not in like September, right? So by the time we get to September, we'll have a pretty decent idea whether or not the the mills that were our 74 mills and everything that we've got will cover us and and you'll know whether you can step away from the ledge or not and if we need to at that point we can always assess uh, the uh, any remaining uh, imbalance through PD1 is that right yes I think the timing would allow for that um, we would depending on how you adopted your budget the the assessment for Park District 1 has to align with your budget. So um, if if you adopted your budget assuming a transfer in from tax revenue, we would need to amend the budget so that it didn't reflect that but was rather an assessment. But I think the timing would allow for that as well. Okay. Uh, Councilor Treaky? Uh, briefly, I just want to say that I think this is a uh, step backwards for taxpayer transparency. Um, I like the idea of moving towards, you know, the major departments having their own mill levies and their own um, clear, clear budgets based on those mill levies. And it worries me to have um, the general fund funding parks. Um, that is always the first thing that gets cut. And um, I, you know, I know that our intention is to do something about it, but frankly, it worries me to, you know, put something in, um, in writing, because literally that's what our budget is going to be, which says that we're done with PD-1 before um, we've really replaced it with something. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, other comments on this item? Um, let me just mention uh, one item that's out there that uh, I don't want anybody to panic about, but I would kick myself I, if I hadn't said it later, and that is that there is a, uh, a voter initiative floating around that uh, the Montana League of Cities and Towns is um, working hard to defeat, but 
uh, it would uh, uh, require that uh, cities could only increase their assessments, their taxable value by 2% from the December 1st, 2020 values. Um, the, there's no exception for uh, that I can see for uh, cities with self-governing powers, cities with charters, whatever. So I guess that would impact us if that were to pass. Um, I think it would uh, uh, be strongly opposed. They'd have to get the right number of signatures, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, I, I, I think we should oppose that effort, <laughs> um, given how much we are going to be relying upon these property valuation increases far beyond 2%. But I just want to mention that that is floating out there. Um, other discussion, though, on 10, or do we have a, I'm not hearing, uh, I've, I've heard two comments uh, in opposition, Council Members Joy and Tariki, um, but that would suggest that there is a majority in favor of item 10. Am I perceiving that correctly? Yes, we extrapolated. We extrapolated. We, we did, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We did the uh, thumbs up uh, uh, thumbs up and stuff. So, okay, we'll move ahead then um, to number 11. Um, this is the $500,000 jail capacity for misdemeanor offenses. Councilmember Owen specifically said she wanted to comment on this. So I'm going to turn it up to Councilmember Owen um, if she would like to uh, go first, or you can wait later, whatever you want. Well, yeah, I've, I've really been trying to decide how to approach this. I hate asking questions I don't know the answer to, um, but I, I don't know if the chief wants to talk about this or wants to share some thoughts on it. <laughs> well, I just thought you should get a little time in the spotlight. Yeah, thanks. No, I got this Andy bomb at 245 today, so... Uh... <laughs> relatively new uh, on this thing, uh, quite, quite surprised actually. And I would say um, if it comes to fruition, uh, fully in support of this, um, I think it is no um, mystery that the uh, lack of jail space is severely inhibiting the police department's ability to, uh, to provide uh, the safety that we're, we're uh, entrusted with for the community. And so anything that we can do to help alleviate that, and we have been long-term partners, uh, not only with the Sheriff's Office, but with other par uh, community partners, to try to reduce the capacity. Um, as you're well aware, a little bit difficult talking about jail expansion, so the efforts have been, let's get people out of jail, and let's divert people um, out of the justice system, and we've been working very, very hard with that. So I was kind of surprised uh, that that this came up in this uh, in this fashion. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, Mayor, your uh, instincts are spot on. Uh, this has to go on in perpetuity. I mean, you're essentially creating um, a detention facility, although you're going to be calling it a. Um, a temporary holding facility, but essentially, uh, I don't want you to confuse, uh, for lack of better terms, a drunk tank, where we're just going to let people um, get themselves sober over a day or two and then kick them out with a facility that are we're going to put people in that are arrested for misdemeanors. And there are plenty of those, and um, a lot of our warrants that we have passed on um, are misdemeanor of nature. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to send the message that even the most minor offenses are not going to be tolerated any longer. Um, and so this is where we're struggling now. So I certainly would embrace that. Um, I know that there are, um, you know, modules out there. They're portable that you can roll in, uh, but they still need to be staffed. Um, it's going to be a county operation. I don't any way, shape, or form want to get into the jail business. We'll run into the same issues with staffing it. Uh, the liability issues will um, uh, be significant with that. Uh, and, but, you know, if it's a county-run operation and it gives us extra spaces or whatever for misdemeanors, it will certainly help alleviate some of the things that we're dealing with. And then hopefully um, it can cut down on some of the work that Gina staff has to do as well. 
but again, please uh, recognize that People will get arrested for misdemeanors. We're not going to pick up the person that's passed out in the flower pot and put them there. That is a vastly different concept and one that, you know, frankly, I don't think is legal or tolerated anymore. Sure. Councilor Roy. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. I'm, I'm going to say some things and then feel free to comment on them. Um, so this proposal came out of, as I prompted by Councilmember Joy, a conversation that I had with the sheriff. Um, whether or not the county makes a decision now or sometime in the future to expand YCDF, we have an immediate need right now. Um, the, the sheriff had suggested, and I think we have discussed here, um, what about a holding facility, right? So a 72-hour pre-arraignment holding facility for misdemeanor offenses. The idea would be to cut down on the number of people who are given notices to appear and then don't appear, or the number of people who don't enter into diversion because there's no stick to go along with a carrot. So the idea here would be to create some limited amount of capacity to allow for people to be incarcerated in the hopes that they will either be arraigned get addressed, go on pretrial monitoring, and, and get their cases resolved more quickly, or opt to enter into a diversion program in partnership with Substance Abuse Connect and all of our partners who are working on increased diversion, or that they will be evaluated for, you know, wherever they need to be because they're a more serious felon. I don't want to underscore at all that this is a swing for the fences. This is a big try. It is proposed here, and I think it is wise for us to consider doing this as a modular. First, because it's quick. We could have this up reasonably quickly. I mean, I say reasonably because there are many pieces that have to fall in line here in order for this to work. We have to have prosecutors who can go fast. We have to have uh, public defenders who can go fast. We have to have judges willing to arraign on a 72-hour basis. There's a lot between today and where we might go. I believe that putting a negotiating team together to work with the sheriff on what this proposal would look like, to indemnify the city so we don't have liability, to let them staff, to let them do what they do because we don't need to be in this business. When we put money behind that, we become much more serious at the negotiating table. I do think there's a path by which this could potentially be operational during the fiscal year, which is why it's in here. It's only in here for, I think, what half of a fiscal year cost would be. But it's specifically being suggested as a modular facility so that we can try it and see if it works. Now, it's not no foundation. I mean, it will have to go on a concrete pad. There has to be infrastructure, right? So it's not um, portable in that we drive it up and drive it away, but it's not bricks and mortar. It doesn't require a bond. It allows us to test and see if we can actually be much more aggressive on the misdemeanor side so that people don't continue to commit offenses, right? They get arrested on one charge, given a notice to appear, and then continue to commit two or three more crimes that night. Um, it moves cases along faster because what we know is that part of the jail problem is that cases don't move fast enough. And if we can improve that movement, then we free up at least some bed capacity at YCDF. And I think we increase our chances on diversion. So those are why I think we should consider it. This is not going to be easy, but I think it sends a signal that the chief has said is that we're not going to tolerate disrespect for our police officers anymore. And I think this is a bold albeit challenging move. So, Chief, I don't know if I've said anything that you disagree with or think I'm off base. No, I, I concur with that. Um, uh, definitely bold, definitely makes a statement um, that a community needs to hear that. And I heard it throughout your conversations all night. You know, you're really putting a premium on public safety. And I think the bottom line is that, you know, you, you've really come to a cordial loggerhead, if that's an oxymoron, I don't know, with the county on, on the jail, and we need to do something uh, because doing the same thing over and over and over again um, isn't helping, and our city is getting bigger. So it's just going to be an exponentially, um, exponentially uh, growing problem. So I'm not one to go looking for no in anything, and it's always no if you don't ask, and if I'm very surprised. Um, but pleased that they would entertain that, that discussion. Um, so, I mean, we're very, very uh, willing to partake in that. It's a jail operation through and through. Make no mistake about that. They will operate it um, pretty much as they are right now. It's just going to be misdemeanors. Um, as council member indicated, we need to fully engage uh, Gina's staff because, uh, you know, they're the, the con conduit with 
Judge Kolar. Uh, so you have a lot of moving parts with that. Uh, but you can move them a lot quicker than we can get somebody in front of a district court judge, which is a whole different, a whole different animal. Uh, raise your hand if you don't want to ask questions or comment on this one. Um, I saw council members uh, Joy, Chiriki, uh, Purrington, Ripsis. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Chief, I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but um, the sheriff is an elected official, but is he not dependent on the county uh, to fund FTEs? So if you increase your capacity, you're increasing the demands on staff, maybe, I don't know. Um, not sure, because I don't know the numbers, but um, is is the sheriff then reliant on the county commissioners to get, to gain that funding in order to add FTEs to this facility that would be there? Thank you. Uh, council member, that would be correct. I assume that some of the uh, 500,000 would go to FTEs as well. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I would say right now, um, you know, the, let's just say we were able to get a modular up in a, in a month or so. They can't staff what they have right now, let alone open up another 24-7 misdemeanor um, facility. So staffing, as, you, as you're as you well aware, the bricks and mortar, not not so bad. It's the uh, O&M, the day-to-day -day operations, and they are decimated uh, with personnel down there. You know, I think they're, you know, 10 or 13 was the number that I that I heard with, with more on the way out. So, uh, so that's something to consider, but I would assume some of the, the money that the city would uh, would put up would go to offsetting FTE costs. Uh, thank you, Council Member Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, um, that twenty five thirty people number is that more based on the finances or the reality of the flow of people through the system? Uh, council member, I would say that uh, on my brief research, I would say that it's the capacity of a modular. Uh, they're not all that big, uh, mm -hmm. and so you're not going to get several hundred people in there. But again, what can you manage uh, as far as staff? And I don't know what the number is, uh, jailers per X number. I don't know. I don't know what that is. But would you? Would it be very difficult for you to kind of come up with a? number that would say what that what that population number would look like over you know or no right. council member I think it'd probably be pretty easy whether it is yeah. you know one of those things that's easy math and I can't explain it but you know one jailer per five people and I don't know why but that's what the stats say um, again they run a unique um, operation down there council member boy I could probably add more to that uh, they have one or two people overseeing a whole secured area. So they do a lot with not a, not a lot of people, but we'd be looking at a completely different setup in this uh, modular as I envision yeah. it and what I've seen. Yeah. yeah, no, I get that. I just, I just want to have a sense as to how big the problem is that we're trying to solve and, you know, before we go in trying to solve it. Well, the, the misdemeanor problem's big. Uh, yeah. Those are the ones that we report to you are not um, getting warrants served and getting getting turned away uh, because the jail is filled with felons and, yeah. and people that need to be there. Yeah. And so then these individuals are emboldened. Well, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. And I keep not showing up in court. So what happens is that. No, no, I, I get that. Okay, I, I get that. What I'm, what I'm concerned with is yeah. if it's 300 people that we need to, to be dealing with, then this becomes a drop in the bucket and has kind of the same impact. But if it's 10, 15, 20, 50 even, I think, you know, this could have a, a serious impact on it. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, it doesn't take long for the message to get out. So, you know, a manageable number would, would probably be a good start. And again, if it's modular, you can bring stuff in, add to it, take away as needed, but way down the road. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Pierton. So, uh, Jennifer, when you were explaining this, and just to follow up too, uh, you said it was for, for pre-arraignment. And then after arraignment, the judge can sentence these people to jail would that jail be 
the uh, Yellowstone County detention? That's or would correct. It, be mis it wouldn't be the misdemeanor. Correct. These would solely be for prearrangement. That's arraignment. correct. A, a, a definition is, um, if I may, it's a temporary confinement facility for custodial authority of prisoners, uh, usually less than 48 hours, pending their release, arraignment, adjudication, or transfer to another facility. So your scenario is correct. A okay. judge can sentence somebody to the detention facility. They're going to go to another spot. This, uh, this is 48 to 72 hours, depending on how long. So if the judge sentences them to, um, I'm trying to think of the terms, but um, they'll put them, they'll release them with monitoring. Possibly. So that monitoring right there, that's going to increase the number of monitors that need to be out there, what I suppose, with the sheriff's department. And that wouldn't be city or the, alternatives. I mean, I don't correct. know. Yeah, you have private vendors that that are all over that. Yeah, so they're they're happy to have more more clients. And they have been very, uh, and you've sat in the, the conversations, they are very, very adamant about keeping track of their people and getting them in front of the judge. Uh, and so I, that that's where that would go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ripsis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is a hugely important issue, and, and I want to commend uh, Council Member Owen for bringing this forward and the and the Budget Committee. Um, I might suggest that we also want to look at, you know, in addition to putting a modular unit at the jail, is there a way we could partner with uh, some of those private vendors, like an alternatives to to provide this kind of service? Right? It might be more expensive, might be less expensive. They might have less issues with staff. They might have other uh, different things. So that might be another avenue to look at uh, while we go forward evaluating, you know, pre arraignment holding options. Is there a way to engage a private partner um, that might be able to? You know, address this from a different perspective that the, the jail might. Uh, either way, I think it's worth evaluating, uh, and we should move forward with, with all due speed with with, with this. So, um, thank you for bringing that forward, and and let's get it going. Uh, Chief, uh, question for you: uh, In a different life, um, uh, the Hardin Jail. Um, I represented uh, three rivers, uh, or two rivers, two, three, two and a half, whatever authority that took over that facility. Um, after, when they were looking for uh, somebody to um, uh, take it over. And at, those, at that time, and this is, uh, having toured it, I'd call it a gem of a beautiful facility, made as a prison, uh, looked like a jail to me, you know, and um, uh, designed by people for that purpose. And at that time, Yellowstone County said, ah, we would never put anybody in that thing. And uh, the city of Billings, and, includes, and I think probably the chief of police said, we would never put anybody in that thing. What's changed? How does a, a modular become better than the hardened facility? Um, well, Mayor, I'm not the uh, corrections expert, but um, the people that I have talked to who are in the business said that that facility in Harden was woefully ina inadequate for um, corrections um, operations. Uh, there was, you know, there was no light. Uh, we did have an escape down there, and, and it was indicated if you jumped over the counter, you owned the place, and that's what two or three people did. Uh, and uh, and so the just the uh, the setup, the whole thing, according to the experts, that it was not suitable. Logistically, is why would we a pay rent for a facility? And B, where are we going to get the money to be traveling people back and forth uh, to court? Um, and then again, having having people staff that full time, um, I, you know, no disrespect. I think they'd probably want to live in Billings. So how are we going to get people to work and back and so on and so forth? So logistic. Logistics, the dollars didn't add up with that. And, so. and that makes total sense. I, I was more totally. going to the physical layout of the building. So. Yeah, it was and, totally and the sufficiency, and I, I know and nothing and about this you know, modular yeah. concept. So, um, Council Member Neese, Council Member Rowan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I really like this idea, and, I, and again, I, I appreciate everyone bringing this forward so that it's really something we can do for the public safety because this is what, one of the biggest complaints I get is, you know, why are, why are criminals not being arrested and put in jail, being arraigned, and they're back on the street? So 
Um, but I do have a question because you mentioned this, there's a long process for this to get this going, and this is a half year. Um, and, and I'm going to ask Gina a question because you mentioned, Gina, that she has to do this. So, Gina, can you can you give us your your opinion on how this how this would change your department if 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 this is uh, this was implemented? Councilmember Nice, I I'm not sure that I can give you a full um, analysis of that at this point without uh, meeting with the prosecutors and discussing it, but. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's doable. I mean, I don't think it's out of the realm. I, I don't think it's going to, um, spread our office too thin because there are, you know, there are arraignments every day anyways. And the court is, we're there regardless. And I, I, I don't think it's going to, I mean, it's certainly going to increase the number of people we're seeing and potentially cases, well, probably not cases, but um, I, I, I honestly don't think that a 72-hour appearance requirement is, is going to change anything because the people who are in jail have that, you know, they have to be seen anyways. There has to be an initial appearance and our, we, we have people present for those, so. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Councilor Brown. Thanks, Mayor. I just wanted to, um, I guess, say two quick things. First of all, um, I, I did want to give kudos to Councilmember Boyette and Gulick, who debated this in the Budget Committee with me and, and came on board and supported. Um, I appreciate that. And Councilmember Boyette, who has been championing this out with our other local government partners as well, so I think they deserve credit as well. But I also wanted to talk to this issue very quickly of staffing. It is true that they're down detention officers at YCDF, um, but I think it's also true that our officers are frustrated. They're frustrated with having to do catch and release. And I think that whether it's YCDF detention officers or our police officers, they should hear that we're going to try. And I think that changes some of the staffing calculations. I think when you believe that the system isn't working and nothing's going to change, you think, you know what, I'm going to go work somewhere else. But if we show them that we're going to assess our municipal court system and make it as efficient as possible, and we're going to keep asking our county partners to do the same and do it with us, and we're going to try some things to address capacity issues, even if it isn't permanent bricks and mortar, but just sort of a, a, a test to see if this type of thing makes a difference in our community, I think that changes the calculus for some people who may be considering careers in this space to say, you know what, at least there's some momentum. And I'm hopeful that that will help with staffing issues um, both at this facility and YCDF. So just wanted to throw that out there for consideration. Thank you. Question for Chris. Um, Chris, who's, there's a lot of analysis that would have to go into this. Who's going to do it? Whose responsibility is that? And um, do they have that capacity? <laughs> <laughs> probably the last one to be answering because I'm I'm assuming to, to a degree what's been described here right is the sheriff is going to continue to pro provide and expand the capacity to provide incarceration services and I don't need to know I don't know today how the sheriff provides those services and I don't need to know so in this regard I think it's how much financial resource do we need to appropriate to paying the sheriff to do a part of their responsibility and help our police department and prosecutors and judges. So I guess I'm struggling a bit other than to know a little better the analysis of if 25 to 30 people end up being the number around a modular facility that makes logical sense to us, uh, our internal experts, how do they think that will make a difference relative to our officers out on the street? And, the criminal activity that's happening in our community. Uh, okay, Chris, I mean, it seems to me that somebody it? should do an analysis of what are the benefits to the city? You know, how many people and this could have an impact. Somebody needs to look at is $500,000 half of what's needed or is it double what's needed? Well, we know it's not double what's needed, right? But I, again, I think that number was pulled out. Um, is the structure, even if the sheriff is primarily in the driver's seat, these are, quote, our uh, customers. Um, so we have a real interest in the, the nature of the facility. That's far above my pay grade and yours, and nobody else is standing up. Don't we need to have somebody at the city invested in all these tough questions? Councilmember Boyette. 
Uh, Councilor Boyd is volunteering to yeah. be that person. <laughs> well, Thank I you mean, very much. Soul. <laughs> but, but, I mean, this is just the beginning of a long road. We just I mean two or three of us go over and meet with the sheriff and start the pro the dialogue. That's what I envisualize because we don't know the answers. All we do is have some money set aside, and maybe it's not enough. Maybe it's too much. Who knows? But I mean, I volunteered, and, and who else wants to go? We'll go meet with the sheriff and start talking. That's what it starts. The dialogue. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Tricky. But when I saw that, I suspected that the first hundred thousand dollars would go to a consultant to answer your questions. Yeah, that's probably correct. <laughs> okay, um, are, have we uh, uh, ready to move on? And uh, I, again, I am hearing a majority of the council in favor of item eleven. Uh, if I were, I had the perfect world. I'd put that money aside, and I would broaden this to something like uh, uh, labeled uh, criminal justice system improvement fund <laughs> with this being one of the options but also looking into what the county commissioner said they wanted us to look into as being a part of the option but um, I, I don't think I would win that so um, I'm not gonna even make that proposal um, I, 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 if that's done we're done with the uh, the staff report um, pat yourself on the back. Uh, that was a lot of good discussion. Um, is there anything else, Andy, that you need from us? No, not this evening. I'll follow up with what I can tomorrow, and then uh, we'll go through it all again Monday. So. Okay, very good. Right. Chris, are you satisfied that uh, we have finished item number two? <laughs> Oh boy, what a window. Um, I mean, you guys debated and hashed this out. It gets real next Monday. I, I, I don't know why it would take six hours of public meetings to get through these based on the work that you've done tonight, but we've got two hours a week from tonight. And it's very deliberate, it's two hours, because we do have some big land use decisions and folks coming down from uh, the federal government related to the annexation zone change, things like that. But I hope that this was, I certainly found it healthy. I think it provides each of you ultimately with a whole lot of debate that hopefully you don't have to replicate one week from now and again two weeks from now, but that'll be up to you. It'll be your prerogative as to how much time you want to rehash over these 11 potential amendments as well as any other ones you may offer. But that was the intent tonight, was for you to get to work through some of that. Um, and as Andy said earlier, you'll be in a position to fully adopt a week from tonight or get partially through it. We would ask at the break. We have told the federal government folks from the, from the uh, National Guard that we will get to them immediately after the break so that they know with people coming in uh, what to expect for next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on then to our um, uh, third item, uh, higher performing communities presentation by Council Member uh, uh, Gulick. Uh, because the hour is late, um, uh, Council Member uh, Gulick's plan is to spend around 20 minutes and we'll open up for questions uh, on his presentation. And that will be almost the end of our meeting. Well, thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, uh, for the opportunity to continue a conversation on um, high-performance cities that we started last March. And, um, you know, we all love Billings. We all want to have a safe, uh, prosperous community with a high quality of life. Um, none of us want to have an onerous tax burden. And, and so the question is, how, how can we be really strategic about the actions we take here to achieve that? Um, so I think what we need to be having happen in our community is, is that the taxable value of our private sector development uh, needs to be increasing faster than the cost of services uh, that we have in, in the city in order to, to achieve a lot of our goals. And, and so the, the question is, what strategies can we as the city employ? That is, how can we be most strategic uh, with our infrastructure investments so that we get the biggest return in private sector development value and thus also tax revenue? Um, 
you know, if we if that occurs, then we're able to uh, either uh, reduce um, our taxes uh, tax rates to individual property owners, and or uh, provide more value to community members uh, through uh, more you know, parks, trails, uh, a more of a, a, a presence in police that can can prevent. Um, uh, prevent crime from recurring. So how can we be most strategic? So last uh, year uh, presented this slide here showing how our, our property taxes have been increasing over the last 45 years, a slightly higher, uh, faster rate than, than our population growth. Um, and this is even a little more uh, um, acute with, with our, our street infrastructure. And so it's not yet, I'd say, alarm bells, but it's definitely not a trend that we want to see continue, especially when we have other priorities, things we'd like to see happen in our community. And so how do we account for this growth in the, the cost of, of uh, our infrastructure going faster than our population? Um, I think there's plenty of factors, but I think one of the, the major ones is that um, our community is um, increasingly has a, a you know, lower tax revenue on a per acre basis. Um, and we showed this uh, chart of, of the city uh, last year. Uh, it, it's showing the tax revenue on a per acre basis. And uh, the green areas have the lowest tax revenue on a per acre basis. And then um, the areas that are uh, tan, orange, and, and red have, have the most. And it's a little hard to see at this scale. But we zero in on, on uh, uh, downtown, uh, we can see that there is uh, a greater concentration of those red and orange and, and tan properties. If we zero in even more to some properties in downtown, um, the top 10 properties are, are in downtown. And the, the one at the very top is the Montana Power Building. It looks like this. It's where the um, uh, Montana Brew Pub is located. Um, it has a lot of tax revenue on a per acre basis. And uh, downtown, the 10 properties we see there, uh, the average of those uh, shown was about $43,400 on a per acre basis of tax revenue each year. This is back in 2012 when this study was done. Um, and th these were not cherry picked properties. I've looked at other properties, it's actually uh, pretty consistent. Well, at least for buildings that are occupied. If we compare that to the rest of the community, uh, where we have both uh, commercial properties as well as residential, uh, we're getting about an average of $1,380 on a per acre basis. I mean, again, I want to make clear that's a per acre basis. Is the cost of services on a per acre basis higher in downtown? Undoubtedly. But the the amount of income we're getting from downtown is about 30 times uh, as much as we are for the rest of, of the community. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident, we'll, we'll see with the cost of services study, though, that, that the, uh, the cost of services downtown is not 30 times higher uh, than the, the rest of the community. I think we'll find that the uh, cost of services is spread much more evenly across our community. Um, if we look at fire stations as an example, um, they are distributed pretty evenly because uh, their response time is largely a function of distance. And so that means the lower density areas don't have as much of a tax base to support them. So our areas that have a higher tax base, like our downtown, is helping support the rest of the community. And that's good. We need to have, as our community has grown, it's good to have our downtown growing also, so it helps support the rest of our community, and so that they're both they're both increasing. Um, and it's you know I give the example of, of fire stations, but uh, certainly the higher cost to serve the lower density areas uh, per unit of tax revenue means that on streets we've got more pavement to plow, to sweep, to stripe, to resurface. Um, we've got more street lights and electricity use. Uh, we've got fewer, more, more uh, feet of, of sewer and water pipes on a per unit of, of tax revenue. We've got more time to collect garbage and truck to the landfill. More area per patrol officer to, to cover. Um, so that just means there's less resources left over for, for parks and, and, and safety and, and trails and things of those nature. 
So just a, a quick little model of how local economies work. Consider a bathtub. So uh, if you imagine a bathtub where there is an inflow of water coming in, and that's from uh, you know, exports of, of resources and goods and services. Um, but we also have some, some leaks. We have water leaving that bathtub as well. We have uh, leaks to fund infrastructure for low density development that isn't generating uh, sufficient tax revenue. We have leaks um, for going to out of state businesses um, for foods, goods, and services. Um, and, and that means that we're not building equity locally because the, there's not people, uh, they're not hiring the secondary and tertiary jobs. The, the accountants are in, in Seattle for Starbucks rather than in Billings for uh, City Brew, um, the attorneys, the uh, payroll services, that kind of thing. Um, that's a whole other presentation. Um, uh, leaks to efficient uh, utilities for inefficient um, and wasteful uh, buildings and equipment. So your community wealth is the level of water in that bathtub. And if your inflows uh, of water are no greater than what's leaking out of it, your, your, your community wealth is not growing. Your equity in your community is not growing. Um, but the kind of conventional economic development approach has been focused largely on the inflows, just trying to, ex to increase that. It hasn't been as focused on how do we control some of those leaks there. So a more, what I call, homegrown prosperity economic development model would have that, let's focus on those leaks as well. So we have a, yeah, we address, a, a, if people understood the benefits of, of, of buying locally, of, of, of uh, patronizing local businesses, understood that how the money stays and recirculates to the economy, that, start, that benefits us. That starts to raise our level of water. If we um, have our, our, our building stock is more energy efficient because we have um, facilities, people who are, are tracking our buildings, and we have people using things like the CPACE program um, to, to address energy inefficiency. Uh, and if we also are, are plugging uh, infrastructure investment leaks with high value private development, uh, where their tax value uh, revenue is, is, is higher than the cost of services. Um, that means then we are more resilient as a community. We don't have to, we're not dependent on having uh, a, a lot of uh, water flowing in to, in order to maintain a high level of, of, uh, of community wealth. Um, and, uh, yeah, there are some communities that have a lot of water, a lot of resources flowing into them, but they're not they're not gaining any wealth because it's flowing in, it's leaving as quickly as it's coming in. So we're we're trying to to build equity in our community. So you know, what does wealth accumulation look like? I think a lot of us are familiar with that it means for for businesses and residents. You know, less debt that has interest, uh, more equity, things that you uh, can reinvest in your business. Um, but for the city, what it means is um, that we can have high quality parks, trails, and recreational facilities. We can have sufficient public safety resources that we can prevent rather than react to crime. Um, it means that we um, have streets and infrastructure with, where we're not having deferred maintenance, where we're actually, um, you know, the, the, the rate of annual depreciation of our, our streets is less than um, the maintenance we put in. And we can do that <clears throat> um, without increasing our taxes if we're really strategic. So what we should be trying to do is, is build community wealth by just as farmers are looking to maximize their yield. They are trying to maximize the bushels per acre um, because they have a limited resource. So should we as a community be trying to tend to the health of our neighborhoods in downtown so that we are yielding the greatest amount of value on a per acre basis. And the goal ought to be to have the lands of our city as productive as possible. And so I think our city policies and our practices should support that goal. So what does that look like? What, do we, what can we do to, to move in that direction? And, and um, so I think one of the things we can do is, is how we design our streets it has a big impact on what can happen in the properties that are adjacent to those streets. Um, and we'll find, just like our downtown is, is one of the more walkable areas, that's where you have highest value occurring. 
So when we take vacations, um, um, these are the kinds of places we're attracted to. Um, we don't usually go to places like this to, to vacation. Um, but the majority of our infrastructure dollars are spent at the latter. Uh, why are, are we doing this? So the benefits of these walkable places extend beyond aesthetics. They're, there's, they are actually generating much more wealth uh, than, than the, the lower density areas. And I'm not going to get into all the benefits of walkable districts. Um, I did, and the um, PDF that you received uh, go into, uh, I think it was another additional 11 slides on that. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move beyond that. Um, and just talk a little bit about walkability theory. What makes for a place that's walkable? Um, I mean, Grand Avenue has sidewalks, but it's not regarded as a very walkable place. Why, why not? Um, and, and what would a combination of public and private investment, uh, what does it take to make walkable places? So the first uh, notion for a walkable, there's kind of four points for, for what makes for walkable areas. The useful walk is, means that you have things that are uh, within a 10 minute walking radius. So there's gotta be a reason to, to go out walking. We're not talking about just recreation, we're talking about walking as a mode of transportation. And so if you uh, have uh, places where people live that are, are within walking distance of schools, of churches, of uh, businesses, of grocery stores, um, then uh, you are, are reaching the, the useful walk. And so. Um, the city has taken some good, uh, good steps towards this with uh, adopting uh, 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 recode. Um, we have uh, a greater amount of densities and, and uses that can be, that can be closer together. Uh, they're not separated in the way they used to be. Um, the second part of the walkable, walkability theory is that you have to have a safe walk. So, um, and this is an area where we as a city have a lot of, of influence because we own the right of way. Having street design that slows traffic is really essential. Um, so things like the two-way conversion we're doing in downtown is excellent. Um, um, Ten foot wide lanes slows traffic down. Um, tighter radius corners. Um, you want to also keep the pedestrian area buffered and, and protected from traffic. So you, you're providing boulevards, you have street trees, uh, you have parking uh, on street, not off street, um, whatever possible. And you're reducing the number of curb cuts that cross that sidewalk. The third part of the walkability theory is the, what they call the comfortable walk. So you want to have buildings that uh, define the, the street edge. Uh, we feel more comfortable when we have our, a flank kind of covered. Um, and, and, and having street trees, uh, especially in the summertime, because you can be much more comfortable uh, in the shade than uh, in the blazing sun. The last uh, of the four theories, parts of, of the walkability theory is that you want to have sticky edges. You don't want to have blank walls like this. Um, uh, you want to have instead storefronts with displays. Uh, you want to have, um, and, and so again, this is all private sector stuff. We as a city, you know, I guess some of our zoning ordinances like the eBird area do get into some of this, but a lot of this is the private sector. Um, our, I think our most walkable block in Billings though is, is on North Broadway between 1st and 2nd Avenues North. I think it really embodies a lot of these ideas of walkability. Um, you know, I, yeah. so back to the issue of, of uh, two-way conversion or uh, converting from one-way to two-way. A um, lot of anecdotal research over time, <clears throat> or, um, but there was actually a more rigorous study that was done uh, in 2008 that looked in, in Louisville um, that looked at a, a, a pair of streets that were changed from one way, a multi-lane one way, to two-way streets, and they had that as the experiment, and then the control um, was another pair of streets that were uh, uh, remained as one way. <clears throat> what they found over the three-year period after the streets were converted uh, to two-way is that robberies on the street, uh, the streets that were converted to two-way went down 
42%. Uh, auto theft went down 32%. And at the same time, it was climbing on those adjacent streets. So it's not merely that it was declining 32% everywhere. Um, auto collisions went down 60%, and they increased in the adjacent areas. And the property values increased by 39% even as they declined in those adjacent streets that were one way. These are really extraordinary values. And I, I think um, the main thing that they, the slowing down of traffic is, is probably the biggest differential. With the robberies, you have more eyes in the street. The more walkable it is, that means you have more, more people on the street, more eyes in the street. Um, you have less auto theft, uh, more again, more eyes in the street, less auto collisions, probably mostly because people are driving slower. Uh, property values increasing because uh, you have uh, more foot traffic for, for commercial activity. Um, they also found that, it, that uh, yeah, what makes them the finding even more impressive is that traffic safety improved on the streets they converted even though traffic volume increased on those streets um, by 13 and 40%. Um, and on the same period, the other, uh, the traffic volume on the one-way streets actually uh, dropped. And, and, and the reason is because people could get to the, their act, they, they more directly to the, the, their, their uh, destinations. So the little chart at the bottom is really hard to see, but um, right now in downtown, if you want to get from one place to the other, you take one-way streets, you have to go a much further distance to navigating those one-way streets. They, you just can't go directly to there. And so you actually increase the amount of traffic um, without um, increasing the, the functionality. So, um, Also another street they looked at uh, was a street called East Beck and Breckenridge. Part of it's one-way, part of it's two-way. The average property taxes per block in the one-ways uh, was was twenty thousand dollars, and the, the two way was forty two thousand dollars. There could be other variables there too. You know, I, I I don't know about those those aspects. But what it does suggest is that that properties on the two way streets uh, were more desired in the marketplace. Um, this is a project you will be seeing coming before you at some point um, here in downtown Billings. Uh, People prefer to work and live in, in those walkable places. Um, the city of Billings has already made some downtown walkability improvements. We've made North 29th and, and North 30th uh, two-way streets. And uh, the city is now working with the MDT to improve First Avenue North so that it has these uh, bulb outs uh, at, at crossings, which make it better for pedestrians to cross. Um, it also just slows traffic. Um, and the development community has responded. Um, this is the proposed uh, project that will go where the yesteryear's building is, um, that uh, the, DB, uh, the DBA has, has had the, the process for getting proposals. Um, I'm not going to say that making those improvements single-handedly uh, made this project possible, but I'm going to say it made the developer much more confident about the success of this building. Um, So switching gears real quick, it's also important that we have not only make it walkability, but also make it easier for people to, to bike. Um, right now, our downtown, uh, that, that kind of uh, red rank, rectangle, uh, we have lots of bike lanes going to the edge of it, but it's basically a big black hole for, for people who want to bike. Um, and this despite the fact that it is the greatest concentration of, of jobs and services in our community, and yet it is basically inaccessible um, for people who choose or have to uh, bike uh, in order to, to get uh, places. And, and it's inaccessible to them because they don't feel safe, because um, they understand that there's a potential of, of, um, uh, of a crash. So um, investing, if you invest in, in, in bike lanes, um, that's when you start to see the numbers of people biking changing. Um, and the reason we want to have bikes, more bikes downtown, is there's mode shift. There's less car congestion, but also you find that uh, bicyclists 
uh, have unique, um, there's unique reasons why they are better for downtowns. They actually spend more uh, because they're not driving so fast. They can see what's, what's uh, in the shops, uh, and uh, so they spend more. Um, and you find in, in places that have put in things like uh, protected bike lanes, like in, in, uh, in Manhattan, that the retail sales went up considerably, uh, much more so than um, you know, just overall what was happening. Uh, you find, in, and this is not just in big cities, this is in places like uh, Memphis, I looked at a uh, uh, place in, in Topeka, there's a lot of different places. What they found is that even just the, the, the promise of, of, of permanent ones in the future meant that there was a lot of businesses that moved into the area to invest in those areas. So major takeaways, um, walkable districts, Provide many economic, health, environmental, equity, and, and community benefits. Uh, walkability and its benefits uh, can be improved with good street design, uh, including two-way streets. Um, and the multimodal streets improve the retail environment. So, and then the immediate takeaway would be, um, you know, we are in the process right now of design for making two-way streets. Let's just take a full advantage of, the, of that opportunity to uh, use the best practices um, uh, for, for making walkable and bikeable streets there. The reason that's good for the whole community, even if you don't bike, even if you never go downtown, is that downtown growth uh, of a high density growth supports the whole community in terms of parks, in terms of, uh, of uh, public safety. So uh, with that, I'm, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Appreciate it. Um, just like uh, any presenter, do we have questions for this guy? Councilmember Boyette. Thank you, Mayor. Um, at one time, there was discussion of just blocking off a couple of streets downtown to no cars because they're such a mess. They're in the way. That would be, a, you know, putting tables and having that way you could have bicycles and stuff. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, there is research in, in those, and there are some examples of very successful ones, like Pearl Street in uh, Boulder. Uh, yeah, I think the one in Denver is uh, 16th uh, Street is maybe not quite as successful as that, but, um, uh, but there's a lot of examples that are not successful. Um, and, and I would not advocate for, for complete closures uh, of streets. I think having vehicles being able to access throughout downtown is a good thing. Um, I think the, the nearest example is, is uh, Last Chance Gulch in, in Helena, where just, you know, the businesses is, is just kind of marginal uh, along there. It's harder. They just, they, so I would not advocate that for Billings at this point. Now, if you had a lot more residents downtown, then some of the dynamics can start to change. Uh, Council Member Nice, Council Member Pearson. Thank you, Mayor. Ed, uh, when they did these conversions to two-way streets, did they uh, put them back in parking? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, there, I, nothing in there uh, is about, about the... Oh, the good, that, is, that is good to hear. But um, <laughs> and it's a more serious note. Um, I, I agree. I think they, I think a lot of this, what you're talking about, does make more walkable downtown, things like that. Um, I, I know the downtown area, you know, you can't ride your bicycles on the sidewalk, so you have to be in the street. Um, I think when you're talking about Montana Avenue that are state controlled, you know, those cars can go pretty fast through there, and I sure wouldn't want to ride my bike down that road or near there. And so, um, I mean, we have a few constraints in that. Um, are you thinking uh, that it, when we do some of these conversions of these two-way streets that you actually eliminate some of the parking and put in a separate bike lane that would be on one of the side of the roads and then you do parallel parking on the other side, something like that, or, or actually off, off of the curb? So the, I think some of the pictures I saw where you had the sidewalk, the bike lane, and then the cars. Right. Yeah, so um, there, some of those... Um, so engineering did look at a, f a few different uh, um, options on a lot of those streets. I, I think uh, second and third avenues north lend themselves well to having the sort of more or less east-west um, with, with bike lanes. I think that would be a good thing. People like me, I'm, I'm going to be fine riding without bike lanes. But if I think about my elderly parents 
or that had uh, children or, or grandchildren, you know, they should be able to to safely access downtown as well. And I think right now that's that's not a, a safe proposition. Mary, I, I agree with you. I think if you want to have some families move downtown, you're, you're not going to take your kids on a bike ride downtown streets. That's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Councilor Pearson. Councilor Rowan. Gee, Ed, where do I start? <laughs> I saw you were taking notes. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the things that, because I know that you are a proponent for walkable, bikeable communities, the way that the Billings is laid out in the grid that it is, would you ever foresee Grand Avenue, even Broadwater at this point, and Central to be a walkable, bikeable section of our community? So I think um, you, know, you start with the places that, that make the most sense to where we're closest to being walkable. And I, so I think downtown and, and the eBird is, is, fits that. Um, I think you'd be looking down the road a little ways, but I think we should be thinking about how do we make uh, those corridors um, higher value for our community and be able to support um, what would it take for, for the private sector to want to put um, mixed use development on them? I, I think, I think uh, you know, I have, I think there are ways you could do that. I, I think one of the goals would be right now we privilege with our, with our street network being able to drive all the way across town to the detriment of all the neighborhoods in between, right? People leave the Heights to go shop at the big box stores um, on the West End um, rather than staying close by because we've made it really easy for people to leave uh, and, and speed out of them. And it's, it's, it's detrimental to the North Park neighborhood, which can't e easily access the downtown, but it also means that it's, it's really frustrating for a lot of Main Street businesses that we have a system that is all about getting people out of their neighborhoods rather than, than creating safe places for them to, to access you know, for where services want to be and, and accessing those. So it's, it's, I'm going off a little subject yeah. from, from what your question was, but I think there is a way to do that in the future. But, but uh, the, the, the earliest, the biggest priority would be downtown. Okay. So one, I would disagree with the heights going from the heights to the West End to the big box stores, because they have their box stores for right now. Plus, yeah, you do. <laughs> you don't have Costco. I heard Costco's going in. But the point is, is that they're stopping in, the, in between. I mean, I lived in the Heights at one point, and you do stop in between. So they do access. I guess my other big point that I would make is with having these um, walkable and bikeable sectors is one of the sources of revenue for making our streets the way they are, are gas taxes. Feet and bikes don't pay for streets. And so where is that source of revenue going to come? Because Billings isn't, I mean, I guess it could if everything, you know, kind of went to hell in a handbasket, they would collapse, it would collapse. But at this point, I guess my point is, is that we've got three refineries in Yellowstone County, and that adds a lot to our community. And I think we have to honor that, if you will. Um, if people choose, and I think at this point, it's maybe 1% of people that are biking in Billings, then where did the rest of the, the other 99%, you know, how, how are they to adjust to that one percent plus I think you're leaving out that freedom of movement that people have and also you keep talking about the private sector but I would imagine the private sector is going to do this based on whatever the government decides to come up with local control so I'm just concerned about some of these issues um, I got a page and a half here, so I won't go into them. But those are some of my points that I want to make. I just, um, 
I don't agree with this. I don't agree with Billings doing this. And you know I will vote every time against the two-way conversion at this point because I don't think it's bringing property values up. I don't think it's increasing economic development or economic growth with uh, the retail sector because we've heard from the retail sector and they don't like it. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop. I would respectfully disagree on on um, on on the retail, or I mean, I just even give a demonstration of a development that's coming because of two-way streets. But I'd also make the point that um, having our streets be multimodal isn't again; it's multimodal. It's it's now we're not we're actually benefiting motorists as well because we're, we're reducing congestion. When you have mode shift, you have fewer people who are competing for. Um, uh, fewer vehicles who are competing for that space. So it actually increases the capacity of our streets. Um, I, I think I would also mention that um, you are right that, that uh, people riding bikes are, are not paying the gas tax. Gas tax is about 25% of the, the source of funds for our streets. Um, but I would also argue that the amount of cost of infrastructure needed for, for a bicyclist versus uh, a motorist is is uh, considerably smaller as well. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll yield it back to the to the mayor. Uh, Councilmember Nice and Councilmember Joy. Or I'm sorry, Owen and Councilmember Joy. So, and I think I want to ask sort of a similar question, but in a different way. Do you think these things you're talking about? really only makes sense in a downtown area because it's space constrained and that sort of forces innovation or creativity? Or is there a way to approach a walkable district as a greenfield development? Because I don't think I, that I would be in favor of like heavy handed regulatory approaches or artificially driving up the cost of development. But I do acknowledge that there are lots of people in the Heights who wish they had sort of a walkable district, a place where they could shop and eat and gather and hang out and have that be safe. I don't think anybody wants to see it through us, you know, being so onerous that it does, it becomes expensive to develop. But is there a way to do this in sort of a economically rational greenfield way or does it really only make sense to revitalize downtowns no i absolutely think that you can have walkable districts outside of downtowns and and i i think you know it makes sense to to work with what we have now at, as an initial focus but i think with the um you know neighborhood plan for the heights i envision some town centers um that we'd be developing Greenfield, uh, certainly, uh, but I, I think also there's opportunities. There's some very large sites that are pretty underutilized along the Main Street corridor, kind of between Lake Elmo and Bench. I think you could have a couple of town centers there that would meet a lot of those requirements. I think you will never make Main Street into a walkable street. I think what you do is you create uh, that as, as a, you know, a, a, a boulevard that has high volumes of traffic through it and you have a, uh, a, a walkable uh, district of, of uh, slow streets that's just right adjacent off of it. Yeah, I, so I absolutely think there's their opportunity there. Okay, Councilmember Uh Thank you, Mayor and Council, and um, thank you for the presentation. I have, I have watched uh, during a period I've worked at Burlington School an increase in bicycle traffic on Lewis Avenue. And one of my constituents, one of a constituents, a uh, War Three constituent called me and said, when are you going to take that bike lane off Lewis Avenue? It's slowing down traffic. And I said, that's the point. <laughs> because in front of Burlington School, I can tell you, people are not going 25. They are definitely not going 25. Even when the light is blinking and they should be going 20, they're not going. Now, Consistently, it might be parents too, but because they're in a hurry to get to work. But you know, consistently that, and I've just seen that, and I really think that's a um, a good thing. And I would say around West Park Promenade, there's a lot of walkability in there. People go to Red Robin, they go to Town and Country in that area, right in there. Um, that is a a a model for redevelopment, and also this. Uh, Avenue C apartments, which have that additional higher density development, housing development within that area. And I think if 
there's a developer out there who would like to do an infill project. Uh, the old um, Gibsons on Central Avenue also has that potential. It has the, uh, the, the real potential for, for redevelopment. So I think that the Heights um, is absolutely an area that can do that. It kind of has to be offset from the, the, the higher volume traffic, but it's absolutely possible. And I think um, there's a lot of good ideas in the things that you brought forward. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I just would, would say that I, I, I wholly embrace a larger, more than downtown, but in the interest of the, trying to keep it a, a, a brief, a focused conversation, I, w I, I did focus on a downtown, but, but I absolutely agree that, that uh, there's opportunity and it would benefit our whole community, tax base and everything if we had more walkable districts. Thank you, uh, Council. I think we ought to move on, but I, I just want to end this discussion with a shout out to one of our local businesses, um, uh, Shields. Uh, their contribution to the new uh, paddles and wheels, uh, or is it wheels and paddles? I'm not sure which comes first. Uh, uh, rent uh, bike and kayak and paddleboard uh, rental facility at the depot uh, is spectacular. They have probably 20 brand new Trek bikes that they've contributed to that effort. And um, uh, get down there, check it out. If you just need, you got company in town, you need some extra bikes, you can go down there, uh, take them where you need them. Or if you're just downtown and looking for a bike, uh, it's a great resource. And that's because of Shields and the depot, uh, Michelle Williams, uh, their uh, interns from uh, uh, local colleges doing a great job there. So uh, thank you for that uh, effort um, by those folks. So public comment. <laughs> Have you been here all night for this? You get us. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Hank Jekosinski and uh, address, right? 580 58th Street West, Billings, Montana, 59106. Um, I am strongly in support of uh, Council taking any, any steps uh, to make the city of Billings more walkable and more bikeable. Um, specifically, I've been working with a group of people um, on the two-way conversion project and the feasibility, feasibility of adding bike lanes to, to some streets being converted as part of that. Um, and so thank you to Councilmember Gulick for this presentation. And if any of you have questions um, afterwards and aren't in a rush to get home, since I know it's late, uh, Councilmember Member Neese and Council Member Purinton or anyone else, I'd be happy to visit with you about um, my thoughts on this. And yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and participation. Um, that concludes then, uh, uh, there's no other public comments, so that concludes item uh, th three, item four, upcoming agenda items. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Pearson? No, I just wanted to do a shout out to Hank. We've honored him before here, recognized him for his accomplishments. Also, I just found out he's going to be a senior next year, and um, he is interning at Big Sky EDA, so welcome aboard to the city. And a proud uh, Central High student. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm, yeah, Central student. So, uh, Very good. Um, Chris, anything on item four in the way of upcoming agenda? I'll be good, quick. We've already talked about it. So a week from now, you've got budget for the first few hours. And then you'll pivot to uh, a an sizable annexation zone change. And, uh, and then all the components related to property along Highway 3 uh, for the armory investment. Those are really your big ones. You have a couple more issues on the agenda, uh, ward boundary, but th those are really the two most significant SLID. Uh, but those first two are, I think, the lion's share of what to be prepared for a week from tonight. Very good. Any else, uh, other items of council discussion? No public comment on non-agenda items. So we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.